don't forget to like and subscribe. You can also listen to this on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And we have a PayPal account for any donations that you'd like to give. Your generosity is greatly appreciated. Welcome, everybody, to the Gate Expectations podcast, where I bring in a weekly guest, talk all things Yu-Gi-Oh!, and get to know a little more about each person I talk to. This is the only Yu-Gi-Oh! podcast that is run by a full-fledged journalist such as myself. This is episode 37. If you haven't checked it out yet, you can check out earlier podcasts with guests like Crush Cards, Ruggles, Yasin, Pack, Distant Coder, and many more. My guest for this week is a double-digit premiere event topper. He's recently reserviced on YouTube with his new series, Yu-Gi-Oh! History, and has over 4,400 subscribers on YouTube. It's Joe Girolando. Joe, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I've been loving your channel as of late because I, I've, I've been through all of those years of Yu-Gi-Oh! as well, and you know, taking... Uh, taking a trip back to all these videos kind of gives me like a with the whiff of nostalgia that you know everybody loves to have uh, here and there. So, can you tell me more about like what your channel is all about? Yeah, absolutely. So, I restarted my channel probably a couple months ago now. I'm up to 20 videos. I try to post one about every week, maybe every five days. Mm-hmm. The purpose of the channel is to go back and profile old decks, particularly decks that I lived through. So, we're not going to be seeing anything like Salamangrates or Sky Strikers, I'm talking about 2007, Troop Dupe decks, I'm talking about Rescue Cat decks, I'm talking about Rescue Rapid decks, decks that I actually experienced. And then also, as much as possible, try to detail some matches. I've been playing a lot with a good friend of mine, Sean Montague, and also a few others. Sean's not the only person I've played. But after a deck profile, trying to show a match and then kind of break it down from that point, a lot of players have told me that They might play today, they may have played for the last three or four years, but they didn't play 10 years ago. And it's really such a contrast between older Yu-Gi-Oh! and modern Yu-Gi-Oh! And some people have really responded well to seeing what Yu-Gi-Oh! used to be like 10 years ago, and really have enjoyed that in-depth look at some of the old decks, some of the old strategies, and some of the old thinking that people had. And uh, what inspired you to uh, kind of re- kind of revive your channel in a sense? Because like, you haven't posted in roughly like eight years ago until you made a couple that post a couple a couple months ago with your new video. I'd say about two months before COVID hit, I decided to start playing modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, there was a YCS scheduled in Hartford, Connecticut. For those of you who don't know me, I live currently in Rhode Island. I lived most of my life in Massachusetts, always in that New England area. Nationals, at least the year that COVID hit, was in Florida. My parents have a condo in Tampa, which was a couple hours from the convention center. So it seemed like a good time to try and play for another maybe six months to a year and see what would happen. I'd be able to go to a YCS. I'd be able to go to nationals if I got my invite. Mm -hmm. And I went to a few regionals, got my invite, bought a flight, everything, and then COVID hit. So here I am. I've gotten back into the game a little bit as much as I could, learned the cards, the decks, and all of that. And I sort of had that itch to continue doing something related to Yu-Gi-Oh. I don't really enjoy playing modern Yu-Gi-Oh on Dueling Book or any of the other remote ways, Mm -hmm. which means there's only one other option, which is to go back and look at some old school Yu-Gi-Oh. I, for the most part, have kept virtually all of my cards. So I still have all of these high rarity old decks from 10 years ago, and they've just been sitting in binders in my closet, as you mentioned, almost for a decade. And once I started making videos and it was pretty clear that people were interested in it, it's really given me the motivation to just simply keep going. Uh, First of all, before, before we like dive more into your videos, I love how you're always wearing like a, a a dress shirt now, add a little professionalism (laughs) into the mix. So I I've always enjoyed that first of all, because uh, you know, I, I'm, I, myself, I'm also a professional journalist and, you know, I try to look a little more snazzier when I can. So it's nice to see that you're kind of bringing a little bit more of that professionalism into your videos as well. I was going to point that out real quick. <laughs> yeah, every video I've always tried to go back and think, what can I improve upon? Certainly the quality in terms of just the upload clarity has improved a little bit. I ended up buying a new MacBook. That's really helped recording on Dueling Book. My old mm-hmm. MacBook definitely didn't do a good job of that. My new MacBook does a great job of that. And that's another one. Yeah, why not just wear a blazer? I have a bunch <laughs> of them. For those of you who don't, who don't know me, Personally, I'm a teacher, so I have a bunch of dress shirts and a bunch of blazers and a bunch of things like that for work. 
might as well throw it on as opposed to wearing a sweatshirt. It doesn't hurt. No, and not at all. And it kind of it kind of makes you look like uh, you have a little bit more credibility. Not to say that you you need that per se, but it's just nice to look a little bit more snazzy and kind of bring uh, bring like your your teacher profession into your videos a little bit because you're kind of educating us back on the the history of the game itself too. So which is also nice to have because I, I, I love this kind of stuff. I love going back and looking at some of these decks. And I want to talk more about uh, some of these profiles that you did. Of course, uh, T- Teledad being uh, one of the big decks that you profile, but it's not just you going over the decks. You also have uh, some duels with uh, these decks. Do you not? I do. Not every single deck profile has a corresponding match, but a good amount do. I definitely have a good amount of matches there. It really sort of depends on my availability that given week. You know, some weeks, Sean and I, our availability doesn't line up or Sean or some of the other people that I've been playing against. Mm -hmm. So I end up just doing two deck profiles back to back. But I do try as many matches as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. Do you do have like all all these cards like to be able to build these decks uh, for like each era? Because I'm assuming that there's there's a lot of decks that you throughout like 10 years that you've played um, that... You know, haven't been profiled yet, but you've been using like real life cards to kind of showcase all these. So far, every card in every deck is my own. Mm-hmm. Now, there are some decks that I'd like to profile, but I have very few cards, at least in the rarity that people have become used to. Like I don't have <laughs> Super Luminas or I don't really like Ultimate Judgment Dragon, but I don't have Secret Judgment Dragons either. Yeah. So maybe I'll eventually profile Lightshorn variants, but it's not going to look as nice as some of the other decks. Yeah. It just kind of is what it is. Uh, A good friend of mine, Paul Clark, who, if anyone knows me from eight or nine years ago, they definitely know Paul. Paul was my best friend, still is a good friend of mine. Paul always used to make fun of me for not getting rid of my cards. You know, (laughs) there'd be a bunch of bands, maybe X Sabres, for example, would no longer be viable. The Dark Soul ruling would change. But I would just Mm -hmm. put all my ultimate Dark Souls and Secret Emerus Blades in a binder and never touch them again. Mm -hmm. Well, lo and behold, 10 years later, virtually all of those cards have gone up in value, so... He even made that comment not too not too long ago that I used to tell you to sell everything, but at the end of the day, you were probably right. Yeah, because as of late, like the past, uh, you know, two three years now, uh, you know, old nostalgia cards have really started to like surface and in like really value for one thing. Like so many players now go get like the real cards now and graded, and they get sent back so that way they can like increase in value and whatnot over time. And, you know, you've, at least you've managed to keep all your cards. So you're probably sitting at like over like tens and thousands of dollars in cards with the, with all the cards that I've been seeing being profiled on your, on your videos so far. I haven't really calculated it, but it might be something like that. <laughs> Honestly, the price tag doesn't matter as much. So much of it is nostalgia mm-hmm. and a personal connection mm-hmm. because these are cards that I use at events that mean a lot to me. Yeah. I actually can open up a binder and point to the Stratos that I used at the YCS Long Beach that I got top four. I can point out, I actually have the copies of Red and Blue, Mizuho and Shanai that I used in the first ever YCS that I topped. Oh, nice. So cards, unfortunately, have a lot of personal connection to me, so I typically don't get rid of them. Mm-hmm. It's just what it means to be a collector, I guess. Yeah, that's perfectly fair. I mean, a lot of those cards where we you know, have this set, sentimental attachment to it, we don't want to get rid of it no matter what. For example, my, I have 44 Gate Guardians and Dons of Lugs. Like, I, won't, I don't ever want to get rid of those at all because 44 is my favorite number. So, And, of course, my username, Gate Guardian 44 is like, okay, well, let's Makes live sense. up to the name and let's, let's get 44 of those. So we, we all have those kinds of cards that are like not for sale. And in yours, it just seems to be like oh, almost your entire collection because of the, all the memories they've given you over the years with all your tops. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, even just collecting them, even if I never mm-hmm. used them in a deck, Mm-hmm. I like going back and looking at these old format. I basically have binders and it's just, this was 2011, this was 2010. Mm-hmm. And there's just something to being able to go back and look at it because, yeah. you know, clearly 10 years later, there's interest in doing that. I can just imagine what it'll be like 10 or 20 years later when I'm even older, being able to look back at all of these old decks. Hey, hey man, this could be a video idea for you just to, just to look through all and just kind of like tour you tour us through all the cards that what you want and whatnot if you can historically remember what all when you used all these cards currently i bet i could do that i bet i could tell you and even some cases when i got them or how i got them exactly that like just kind of it's almost like one of those you know like um kind of like the a cribs episode except where you would just you would showcase your Yu Gi Oh binder instead and kind of do a little walkthrough of everything as opposed to like showing off your house 
So I thought about that, but I like just doing the deck profiles and then people see the cards that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. And then, of course, with higher rarity cards, a lot more people are are naturally kind of drawn to it because they like to see that kind of bling just kind of be part of them too. So mm -hmm. it's also like a visual factor as well for, for your viewers. So I understand why you would like to have these kind of higher, at least higher rarity cards for your videos. If anyone has a keen eye and they've noticed all of the Destiny Hero variants that I've profiled, I have mm -hmm. play sets of German, French, and Italian Destiny draws, and I've been alternating between them. <laughs> so even in some cases, I, I do something like that. Well, you These cards are so that. cheap, too. Yeah. Like Destiny draw, Germans, you can get them for a couple bucks. I remember when I was younger, they were $50, $60, $70. Mm -hmm. So when somebody offers you, or you go online and there's a play set of German Destiny draws for $7, $8, it's hard to say no. Yeah, it definitely is too. And you know, a lot of people like a lot of people like to use foreign cards like as a way to even like further pimp out their decks and whatnot. Because some people just like to just go as high as they can as far as blinging out the decks. And foreign cards have always been a, a popular way of of doing so. And is there a particular foreign card that you have that you like that has a lot of sentimental value to you? It might just be the Stratos that I used at. YCS Long Beach, because it's a rare champion pack, Airman Stratos, mm -hmm. which obviously isn't the highest rarity version. Now it's come ultimate, but I always liked the name Airman as opposed yep. to Stratos or any of the other translations. It actually just says Airman. Mm -hmm. It kind of reminds, it gives me a huge like Mega Man feeling to it for, oh, for that. Mega Man is my favorite video game. Ah, I love I love Mega Man. So Mega I, Man X specifically. Yes. Oh my, yes. I, I'm a big fan of like the Super Nintendo Mega Man X series are greatly oh, yeah. the, the X X to X three. I've played those religiously. Oh, uh, I, I, I have the originals. Too. Oh, beautiful! All three rent, of them. I would read those a, video games all the time. I traded. This is something like maybe two thousand and four or five. Mm -hmm. I traded a ultra rare Vampire Lord, the reprint version. Yes. For Mega Man X three. How do you, you know how much Mega Man X three is worth? Even. 15 years ago, that was a ridiculous trade. Yeah, that, that's a ridiculous trade just in, in any stretch of the word. Yeah. How did you score I'm, that? I was just talking about Mega Man. This person at my local said, hey, I have some Mega Man games. And I was like, do you have any of the Super Nintendo games? And he said, I have X3. I'm like, all right, here's my binder. Show show me something you traded for. He pointed at Vampire Lord. I'm like, all right, next week, I'll have this Vampire Lord. And lo and behold, he had Mega Man X3 working and everything. Still works to this day. <laughs> The, the not, not to get it too off topic, but the only disappointment I had with Mega Man X3 is that they didn't add another Street Fighter move for for Mega Man because they did it for the first two, but they didn't do it yep. for the third one. Gold armor That's, instead. It yeah. is what it is. I mean, they could have gave, they could have given them Hurricane Kick, and that would have been fine. That was the the third move that would have rounded it off. But that that would have been funny. I wish they did. Yeah. So now, now to get myself uh, back on topic, uh, let's kind of take a stroll through some of these decks now. Now, now we really get back on topic. Um, we all know that, like, like Teledad, uh, Goat Format, and oh, what was it? and uh, Goat Format, Teledad, and R R Tengu Format. Uh, those are like three mm -hmm. of like the most like popular popular decks. You've touched on a couple of them already. Um, is Go were you around when Goat Format was going on? So I played since Pharaoh Servant, if not before. I remember when Jinzo was released. Okay. I bought my first ever booster pack when Metal Raiders was out. So I played, I may have been 10 or 11 years old, and I wasn't an 11-year-old like Austin Coleman was an 11-year-old who could win yeah. nationals. I was an 11-year-old who didn't know anything. Yeah. So yes, I lived through GOAT format. Did I run GOAT control? No, I remember I ran a Vampire Lord Sacred Phoenix deck. Yeah. I called it a revenge deck because it would come back from the graveyard if you destroyed them. I remember playing against people who ran Go Control at my local, but I did not personally, at that age, run Go Control. I was probably 13, 14 years old. Okay. Yeah, I, I kind of have like a similar feeling, except I was more into like the Warriors at the time. So I'd run like Marauding Captain, Don Salute, Exiled Force. And I was I also had a thing for Freed the Matchless General for some reason way back then. So that yep. was that was that was a card I really loved. Command and Knight? Yeah, oh all the bad God. warriors. I, I love command. Exactly that. Like stuff I wouldn't even like imagine running today, but like those are the cards I want. Because I was also like not very good back then. It took me two years to finally Absolutely. like get good. And I started at Phronic Guardian just to just just as a timeline of how when I played. So it, of course we grew out So I got like the tail end of GOAT format and when I started to become competent, that's when GOAT Farm was already done. And then I started playing 
recruiter chaos. That's when like that's when I started becoming actually like, decent in the game and had an understanding of the meta game itself. Um, and looking at your videos, uh, you have is go for that something you want to touch up on eventually with your deck uh, with your sorry with your channel. I could. I feel like goat format of all of the old format is the format that people have the most experience with. Mm -hmm. So I might eventually just by default, you know, there are a lot of decks. I'll eventually profile just about everything, but I am more interested in profiling, for example, chaos return format, which is very similar mm -hmm. in essence. The games can play out somewhat similar, but you don't have the Trinity power cards. You don't have some of the other cards in goat format. You don't have the emphasis on metamorphosis and goat so I'd much rather profile Chaos Return because I think it would be a deck profile and a series of profiles, honestly, that would provide more newer information, mm -hmm. more novel information than what people see when they look at GOAT format. Because GOAT format really has taken on a life of its own. Yeah, If I profiled an old school GOAT deck, it almost doesn't even resemble what a modern GOAT deck looks like. Mm -hmm. So I could go back and talk about why players made choices they did in 2005. And I think there might be value to that. Mm -hmm. But because Goat Fat has already been evolving and gotten to the point that it is now after years of evolving, it, it's not at the top of my list of upcoming profiles. Yeah, considering now that we there's like a whole culture just revolved around Goat Fat now, it almost feels like if you were to do it now, it feels like echoing what they're saying or just kind of repeating it in a sense, uh, just, just because there's been so much coverage on it, as opposed to every other deck that you've done so far is like we barely touched on. Like I've looked at all the other decks that you've done in your videos and I'm thinking like nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about that format anymore, but I remember living it. I remember being like a really good format. Like Perfect Circle, for example, was great format. I really enjoyed like playing during that era, but barely anybody talks about it. That, that kind of thing. So I think I Chaos guess... Return format is equally, if not better, than goat format. Yeah, well, let, let's it's talk. Just not, it's just not popular. It just doesn't have that, I'm going to say cult following, yep. but goat format has taken on a life of its own. Well, well, I think people who like goat format would equally, if not, enjoy Chaos Return more. Yeah. Uh, no, let's let's talk more about uh, that deck itself. Just kind, of, just kind of give us the, the general premise behind that deck. So Chaos Return was the format a year after Goat Control. So it was in between Goat Control, what people typically called the Reaper Dark Hole format. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that, heading into the summer of 2006 was Chaos Return. Chaos Return is an interesting format because there's multiple iterations of Chaos Sorcerer based decks. So when I'm using the word Chaos, BLS is banned. It's exclusively Sorcerer at this point. Mm -hmm. Early on, there was more of an emphasis on Chaos Sorcerer plus Return from the different dimension. What's interesting about the format is as it progressed, the more people ran returned, the more people counteracted that. So then you very soon after that saw a recruiter chaos deck that in some cases main decked Royal Decree with mm -hmm. monsters like Shining Angel, Mystic Tomato to go with the Chaos Sorcerers. Mm -hmm. And then once that got popular by the end of the format, people started to main deck things like Banisher of the Radiance to counteract the recruiters. So it's an interesting six months because we saw these evolutions in what monsters you use to support Chaos Sorcerer and very differing strategies from maining Decree to maining Return from the different dimensions. play is very similar to goat format but you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about delinquent duo or pot of green yeah as way less of those power spell cards now granted if we went back and played it people would do the same things they're doing with goat control they would jam three dust shoots they would jam solemn judgments and they would turn it into something that's not really representative of what chaos return format looked like in 2006 mm -hmm. but i even think in 2006 it was great and i think if we even tried to remake it now i don't think it would have as much of a evolution as go control has and i still think the decks would look somewhat representative of how they looked in 2006 mm -hmm. and we've definitely seen like uh, that little evolution kind of evolve in itself because uh, before before we did recruiter chaos it was like just find ways to get uh, you know like lights and darks in the grave and then it, i think it was popularized i think kyle duncan popularized yes kyle he, duncan what, in philadelphia in Philly, jump. yep yeah he went uh, won that championship and then when it went into Hamilton, we saw Corey Fabish win yep. it with uh, with Stein. So that was a, yeah, so that's that the was one. A that's the one variable is unlike Cyberstein and Go Control, which it's a side topic. But I don't even think people should be using Cyberstein in modern day Go Control. It was a prize card. Yeah, but by 2006 it was reprinted, and the Cyber Dragon engine had been printed. So you're talking about Cyber End and Cyber Twin. So Cyberstein is 
an annoying variable if you go back and play it. Chaos. Return people did play a tech cyber side. They'd run a last will, they'd go Zaborg. Well, they'd go Cyber Dragon, Zaborg, Last Will, Stein, bring out Cyber Twin and hit you for 8,000. It is a variable that you'd have to worry about. Yep. But I still think the format, even with Cyber Stein, was really good and would be good if people played it today. Yep. And I, I remember at that at that, uh, that Shonen Jump Championship in Hamilton where like I've, I went against this guy who, who, was, who had a feature on Metagame and he was playing this like pure Cyberstein deck, but it was completely different from the way uh, Corey Favors, who was the winner of it, and he ran it with also like Master of Oz, where he could play, uh, he could play Wild Nature's release on it, yep. and that would pump it up to seventy nine hundred. So he found like other different variants to try to hammer home like the rest of the damage. Uh, just like so like Cyberstein plus Master Voss would be enough to do it, but he could also do like the Cyber Twin, the Cyber End, because of like Mega Morph, limit removal work cards to the kind of score home that uh that OTK. And that like really that kind of took off a, a little bit uh until and that was the first card that got uh, an emergency ban in Yu-Gi-Oh, if I recall correctly. Yeah, it was an emergency ban until the following format. So yeah. at the end of 2006, Chaos Sorcerer gets banned, obviously a few other limitations occur. And the, the glaring issue going into the fall of 2006 was that they didn't ban Cyberstein. They yeah. unbanned Ring of Destruction, maybe thinking that that would somehow alleviate the problem, dropping your opponent below 5,000 yeah. quicker. But then they had to emergency ban Cyberstein after David Rodriguez won the Shonen Jump in California. Yeah, because I believe he, he was going against uh, Mario Mathieu in, Mario. in the finals. And then he I think he beat a combined total of three or four turns. Like It was over. It was funny. Like it was... Snap. I don't have it up, but I remember I have read so much metagame, it's not even funny. It was yeah. something along the lines of David looks at his hand, looks at Mario, says, sorry. Sorry, Mario. And yeah. just goes, yeah, who is his teammate? And goes, Stein, Nobleman, Megamorph. Yeah, true, tr and I think Trunade was at three at yeah. that point. It was at two, I believe. Two, I okay. believe it was at two during but... that. Because in the summer, that was the summer event during Chaos Return where Vincent Tundo ran the Royal Magical Library, Giant yep. Trunade, yep. Archfiend's Oath, that deck. And I'm pretty sure it went from three to two. I do remember that vaguely heading into the fall format of 2006. Yeah, because that because Giant Trunade was a, a absolute catalyst for the Royal Magical Library deck. It was probably the second most important card next to Library uh, for, oh, for, for that sure. deck. Because you get to reuse all of your continuous spell cards and basically get like free, free draws again. And that which yep. led up to the FDK, which which was a fantastic deck, by the way. I, I played that for a couple of locals. Loved playing it, uh, by the way. <laughs> Loved Tundo, by yep. the way, as well. Yep, for sure. And, and then, and then we also saw, and then as you said, we saw like Banisher of the Radiance was also attacked. We saw Hydro Get On also be another card that was uh, yep card that good against the like, recruiters, at least yep. a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. The only downside to it was it was water, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't lighter dark, but it could at least plow through the recruiters and develop a uh, you know board. It could develop board presence, uh, and that could also thin out your own deck as well by doing it. Yep, you could crash into the Shining Angel, and then they could either bring out another Shining Angel, which isn't good, or they bring out DD yeah. Warrior Lady, and yeah. you've basically gone up in value there, because if the, you, they're going to put it in attack mode, and you just crash into the Warrior Lady, and yeah. you're left with a Hydra get on on the board. Yeah, but but you've essentially taken away a recruiter, which is kind of the job yes, that was absolutely. meant for, for a Hydra get on to, to be there in the first place, and I know that my one of my local friends who came with me to that YCS decided to take it because i think that it popularized in, in philadelphia before it made its way to hamilton for mm -hmm. during that time and then uh, I, you know after that format went away we chaos sorcerer got banned and that kind of uh opened up the format a little bit and then we started going for years and years and years of, of monarchs kind of ruling the format and then eventually we started seeing like destiny heroes uh, getting into it and you know we've we've had a lot of people in the current formats kind of complain about oh well there's always these top decks running but you know we also had that same problem way back then when like monarchs kind of ruled the format so monarchs in and of themselves have been a pretty big part of really anything from zaborg when zaborg was just released wasn't overwhelmingly popular but after zaborg when the stalos was printed and the first soul control was <laughs> was, was ran for the first time and then yeah absolutely i mean Destiny Heroes came out at the beginning of 2007, so pretty soon after what we were just talking about with Chaos Return within that calendar year. Yep. I honestly didn't have a big problem 
in retrospect with Monarch variants. I like the Monarch variants. That type of Yu-Gi-Oh! I think is great. That one-for-one -one interaction I think is really great. You can play around Soul Control by not putting a monster on the board and making your opponent have to commit to the board first. You can do things, and I think there's a lot of play in some of the old decks with Monarchs involved. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Monarchs was a really great way to teach, like, the newer players where it's say, just because you can, like, commit to the board doesn't mean you should. And that was something that, when I was getting better and better, I kept telling players, you know, just because you can you can commit to the board if you want, but sometimes it's not always wise to because, like, Mobius was surfing this thing up really hard, so, like, you have to really be careful with the two cards that you set and make sure they're, you know, they're not, like, they're chainable or at least, like, they can, like, at least stop Mobius with, like, a pulling the rug or something like that. And, you know, you have to be really careful on how you commit the board because, like, you don't, you don't know what Monarch is going to come out. He's like, because Zabor, mm -hmm. Stalos, and Mobius were, like, the, th like the three that kind of rocked the format. No, Grand Marg was only ran if you were just running, like, the 12-gauge that was, like, popularized. I yep. think that was – I think that was Nationals. I think um, I think Adam Korn won that one or – no, not Adam Yeah, Korn, he did. Uh, well, in 2007, he beat, he beat 12-gauge with Ryza. Ryza was out at that point. Yep. And yeah, I think he was running Prime Material Dragon too at, uh, at that point, or was that uh, that was a different Nationals? So Adam never ran twelve gauge. Yeah. Adam's deck with Prime Material Dragon happened at the Nationals with Dark Arm Dragon and Gladiator Beasts because it was an incredible card against Geyseris. Yep. And he also used uh, Royal Oppression in there as well because he he barely did any special summoning, and the special summoning he would do like you wouldn't care if uh, Royal Oppression yep. happens, or you'd do like use Soul Control, use their monsters to get them because he would use triple of that if I recall, and Reckless Greed yep. too. That was also a thing. So Royal Oppression had a ruling change in the middle of the Dark Arm Return <laughs> yeah. slash Gladiator Beast yes, format where yep. you could flip it while it was face down as your opponent was special summoning a Dark Arm Dragon, activating Monster Born, summoning Geyseris pay the 800 right there for all of Yu-Gi-Oh's history. It had to already be face up on the field. So you had to prematurely activate it. Now with the ruling change, it basically one for one, the yep. special summon card. And if your deck's not special summoning itself, it's really a tremendous card because now you're summoning monarchs. You just one for one, let's say they're monster born for your oppression and you're locking them out of special summoning. So that was one of the biggest ruling changes. I don't argue in all of Yu-Gi-Oh's history because oppression yeah. was incredible up until it's banning. Yeah, and that was a really a quick turnaround when they did that because when, when Adam Cord won the, the Nationals, it wasn't an effect. Then the Canadian Nationals happened, which I participated in, which it didn't happen. And then after that event, that's when it started to take place. And then the following week was uh, Show and Jump Philadelphia. That's the one that uh, Michael Conheim won with the uh, with the gladiator beast himself and and that one that's when the royal oppression ruling changed and when i was in that event like so many people were running royal oppression i had to i had to change my deck even though i was like a week removed i had to change my deck a little bit up to cater to the back row a little bit more because i knew oppression was gonna come out on everybody and i was i was packing it too i think you're off a year adam won in 2007 Seven? and then in 2008 Eight. chris bowling oh, won Oh, sorry, I'm thinking of Corn Monarchs. Sorry, sorry. That's, yep. that's and then yeah. Corn actually ran Monarchs at the 2008 Nationals with Oppression, though. Yeah. So Corn just happened to run Monarchs at two Nationals back to back. And it was the second one in 2008 where we saw the Oppression change. Yeah. And then we even won the Chris like, Bowling one. Yeah. And we've all. Like our like monarchs kind of evolved. Like once the the Destiny heroes came out, then we started going to. Then we started seeing like the T hero, uh, T side. I, like kind of popularized with uh met with a strange move that metamorphosis went from zero to two and then all of a sudden we're now using its uh metamorphosis to to bring out like to abuse malicious or any other monarchs to bring out like ryu senshi or you know and all those cards like so blast from the past for that one again so that was quite an interesting format if i say so but i really enjoyed it i don't know about you yeah i love troop dupe format mm -hmm. i think it's an underrated format mm-hmm and then again, again, and then it translated to once Metamorphosis got like axed again, because I'm pretty sure it got axed right back to zero once, uh, oh, yeah. once the next yep. list got hit. So then it started just turning into a perfect circle. And and people started, and Ryza was still running rampant. It was probably one of the best cards. And then I was starting to use uh, Phoenix Wing Wing Blast. So I think that was still in the T Heroes, if I recall. Wing Blast wasn't really in T Hero. No. Okay. So Wing it Blast... was a perfect circle then? <clears throat> yes. So Wing Blast could have been ran or could have been run during the 2007 national season where troop dupe is legal mm -hmm. where there was a perfect circle variant dale used one to top the canadian nationals for example yeah but wing blast didn't become popular until jonathan labonte popularized it in the perfect circle deck at the end of that format going into the next format so with the mm -hmm. washington shonen jump 
in the fall of 2007 with three rise of three wing blast. So uh, that's when the perfect circle wing blast stuff happened. And then very soon after that, light and darkness dragon got printed. Yes. And then that's really where a lot of people think of perfect circle is with the light and darkness dragon. Yeah. And then that, that's where we saw a lot of uh, Philly Luna and, and Jerry Wang. Those two were probably like two of the most uh, notable players of that format because uh, that was also a great format, by the way. I loved playing that because it was always like it's very intricate and light and darkness dragon when you drop it at the right time is can completely like overwhelm your opponent and yet one of the best cards to counter light and darkness dragon was treeborn fraud because you can continue continuously trigger it over and over and cause light and darkness dragon's attack to fall back down to 800 and you know and finally beat it over which i, I thought it was a fantastic format by the way yeah i didn't mind that format there was some really interesting secondary decks too i really liked baboon burn that yes. was a really cool deck that was a fantastic one i love that yep very cool deck macro cosmos decks were no joke pretty good too mm -hmm. you know typically when you're like oh you're going to jam macro cosmos and dimensional fissure in your main deck no it actually was pretty good you had three solemn three dark bribe and then three macro three d fissure mm -hmm. you're going to stick that macro and against light and darkness dragon decks baboon burn decks that was pretty hard to deal with yeah and it, it was an anti-meta deck. And then it, it could also be a, a Monarch variant in itself because you're continuing yep. special summoning a Scout Plane and DD Survivor, which were like the two like catalyst cards that would come out because that they were they served as their own version of Treeborn Frogs. If they kept getting banished, they keep coming back and back. And it was always a pain. And DD Survivor was 18 attack for like a four-star monster. So that was pr a pretty Survivor. solid attack. Yeah. DD Survivor was you a really... Scout Plane. Oh, did I say yeah. Scout Plane? I think it's... I, 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 I believe so. Okay. But yeah, Definitely same idea. Say. Yeah, because I know Scout plays 800 or 1200, and it's got to be special in attack mode. I definitely remember that. Yeah, but yeah. still, like, those cards were, like, pretty powerful. Like, the only downside to that was is that, like, it can cause some inconsistency issues if you draw multiple copies of D Fisher and Macro Cosmos. And also, they were really susceptible to, to like, Ryza and Wing Blast, because if you keep spinning it back to the top, you're getting, like, you're probably dead drawing your way out of it. Yeah, and those then, decks could even main deck pulling the rug, though. It was, yes. I mean, they had a lot of reaction a lot of cards to react to just the monarch. Now wing blast is a different story. Yeah. But, but when you the, play wing blast and you have to banish, it's not like you're getting value off the malicious or treeborn. So if you dark bribe that it's really totally fine. It's a two for two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It is. And you're still protecting your card, but that, that was just like the, that's the only thing I found with the, the weakness of playing that the, the macro cosmos version is because it just, the inconsistencies that do, because if you draw multiple copies, then that, that you don't want that at all. And uh, it was because wing blast is prevalent. It's like, you're getting continual dead draws if you keep if you keep getting cycled through. It's how I beat many of my opponents when who ran against Mac who ran macro against me. It's just for sure having that against it. But and and I want to go back to the T heroes for a second because I really found that to be I found that format to be really interesting. How that we got to incorporate f fusion monsters again the use of cyber stun at that point in time. And that was one of the decks that you, you mean with Metamorphosis, not Cyberstein. So, my god, yeah, that's what I mean. They used Metamorphosis, uh, with Cyberstein being gone, but you got to use Fusion Monsters yes. again, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, Cyberstein was basically the only way that Yu Gi Oh saw playable competitive fusion monsters. And then, when Stein was emergency banned in 2006, I believe the beginning of two, the end of 2006, mm -hmm. I don't recall exactly when David Rodriguez won his Shonen Jump, I believe it was. The end of 2006 but it could be the beginning of 2007 mm -hmm. regardless that's when cyberstein got banned i think it was december yeah december 16th mm -hmm. so i guess it was only a few months until they brought back metamorphosis and then we had again a deck that actually had fusion monsters with t-hero mm -hmm. right, i, I liked the plays with t-hero where you could metamorphosis dark magician of chaos for cyber twin dragon yep those were always really <laughs> fun and i liked the games where you used malicious into steam gyroid that was the highest attack machine level six out of the fusion deck yeah and if you go back and look at some of the top deck lists during that format some people running t hero didn't include it and i always even at that age wondered how many times could these people have won the game if they put steam gyroid in their fusion deck mm -hmm. if they had limited removal that's the yeah. only reason it matters yeah because i think steam driver was a 2200 attacker so it doubled up 44 and that could steal a lot of games because no nobody was i don't think i ever saw a single steam dry road ever be played against me when i played during t hero format they well regardless of if they summoned it it needed to yeah. be in that extra deck there was no or that fusion deck i guess 
Yeah, they I, didn't, called, I don't know if it was called the X. It was called the Fusion deck at that point. Yeah, it, there was no yeah, limitation. Was, Please put it in there. Yeah, there, there was at the time, and I remember uh, Ham, well, Shonen Jump Hamilton. I would write like thirty cards in the extra deck, and I, I and I, I didn't judge at that time, so I didn't know how painful it was on the other mm. end. But I can understand how painful it is for judges to have to go through like 30, 40 unnecessary cards in the extra deck just because they have it. It's like, oh, I want to play it. Let's throw it in there, and <laughs> now we have fifteen cards. It's been that way for 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 quite some time now, but. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I always found T Hero. I always found was a, another great like chess match deck. And when it was brought in, I know Matt Peddle. Um, he did this with Canadian Nationals. He decided to counter that with uh, with the release of Cyber Phoenix. He used that to yep. kind of counter that because so like monarchs would target like crazy and like thought, okay, let's you can't target me if I play Cyber Phoenix. I'm gonna run that Cyber Dragon, a bunch of machine monsters that basically couldn't be couldn't be targeted in the sense of kind of counter the monarch format. Yeah, what's interesting is when I last went to an event, mm-hmm. a Konami event, or one of the last times I went to a Konami jump or a nationals, I remember I've played Troop Dupe format with Billy Brake. Yeah. And after playing him for a while, we started to play quite a lot, quite differently than we did at the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, at the beginning, you know, we would set monsters and the opponent would summon Cyber Dragon. And then very soon we realized, let's just not put monsters on the field. Like mm-hmm. not set to Koichi. And then it was this really weird back and forth where one person would have a bunch of brain controls and cyber dragons and the other person would too, but neither person would put stuff on the field. Mm-hmm. The way we played was so different than what we would play like back in 2007. Mm-hmm. So it is interesting to go back and play that format and play the machine mirror match. <laughs> I never got to play that. I never played Troop Dupe myself, so I don't know how it feels to be on at, at least like the, the playing end of things. But I, I always had this like the gut feeling every single time I had to go against was like, oh, please don't hit me. Please don't hit me with Machine Dupe. It, it was it was always menacing to have to go against tr- Troop Dupe Scoop every time. And that was kind of like the first OTK that people like really started to like loathe and hate, maybe outside of Cyberstein. It wasn't an OTK, but it felt like it. Yeah, 5,700 points of damage, three draws, no. nine mills. L- unless you had limited removal to go along with that. Uh, okay, that troop yeah, troop. totally. Yeah. yeah. And then I know the Mike Powers, he really popularized uh, Troop Dupe in a different way. He did it with uh, Magical Explosion. I believe that was uh, uh, the show jump club, the only one that Mark Glass won. And he popularized with Magical Explosion and he just, he, so he could score damage, both effect and uh, damage and it was a little bit confusing on how to play against him with that kind of combination yep i don't think that deck ever topped but it was definitely a cool deck i remember i ran that deck a few times at my locals it was definitely a fun deck yeah it was close it, it, i think it was an x2 but it was one of the x2s that mm-hmm. that didn't top the event but boy like one of my friends saw that deck and he was like a perennial like mid card like mid card player in in my locals we would say, but when he started running that deck, he would just steamroll like almost everybody in, in that format. I thought that deck was so unique and so cool. And it's funny how we can see these these decks and kind of have like these cool little variants that are gonna go off. Like we've seen it with Monarch, we've seen them go through like a million different variants, uh, like you know, like T Hero, Perfect Circle, and what, and like Light and Darkness Dragon, that that kind of thing. And it's it's cool that we get getting these kind of varieties, but yet some of these cards can still tan, like, stand like the test of time for a while. Oh, for sure. And then, and then we just, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that magical explosion deck. The reason, the reason why I didn't run it a lot, I ran it at a few locals. Is if you're going to play cards like Monster Gate and Reasoning, I feel like you should just run DDT. But yeah, I, I, that's more I, I of a personal preference. Yeah, yep. I don't know. It just doesn't feel overwhelming. Monster Gating into Cyber Phoenix, and that's what the magical explosion deck did. Yep. I feel like it was just meant to, it was just a meta call. It was just meant to catch people off guard because nobody would uh, kind of expect the play that like Mike Powers would do with that kind of deck. That's the thing. Maybe that's why it was so successful. At least I saw success on the local level as, as I saw it in my personal experience. But I think that was a big reason why it was so successful at that event because it just, nobody knew how to really like play it per se. Because people yeah. thought it was DDT, but it wasn't. And then, it was like, and then they were like, okay, how do I deal with this? Yeah, I mean, but you're still probably going to call four. Off of the reasoning yep. anyway. Yep. So you have Cyber Phoenix. I mean, it's... It, it was a cool deck. It absolutely was a cool deck. I think DDT was probably better, but it was yep. absolutely a sweet deck. Yeah. I, I love DDT, too. And then, uh, you know, after that format, 
kind of trailed off. And then we, we got into about the fall. That's where we saw, we saw zombie master come out and that really changed the, the face of the game again, because uh, return zombies were such a huge deck. And we never saw card of safe return really see any play until that format. And that one and zombie master treated really weirdly during that time, something that was kind of unprecedented at that point. If, if you recall what that was. Zombie Master? Yes. Are you talking about the ruling? Yeah, the the ruling of Zombie Master. How you could have no zombies in the graveyard, but still ditch a zombie from your hand and recur that zombie. Yeah, exactly. Is to making part of save return live on turn one. Yeah. That was it, pretty powerful. Yeah, it, it was. And I think that, that ruling just completely like blew that whole deck wide open. And then they created Ill Blood, which was... Uh, one of the, like a big powerful card. They only ran one copy, but I remember that being like one of the more Some expensive cards. Oh yeah, it was super expensive. Oh, Some oh, ran two. Yeah, okay, but it was uh, super expensive. Yeah, it it was, and that was kind of, and that was like really, really hard to kind of get get around. Like, or want to play zombies? You want to get this like card that was like around like hundred, maybe like hundred dollars US. I don't know how much it would have been in the US, but in Canadian it was just about yeah, roughly like 150, like 120. Yeah, it was like 120, 125. But I thought that deck was like really cool just because we we got to stray away from monarchs, which we've had for like several years, and we really got to step into uh, how good zombies were at that time because like Zombie Master came out, and Pyramid Turtle was was always a great card and always provided like great utility and defense. Uh, I couldn't, I don't think we saw any vampire Lord at all. I couldn't remember the other monsters. They cited it. They cited it. Uh, yep. Re- Reaper was Koki. there too. Yeah. And Koki. Yeah. Ryu Koki. That's right. Because it was the, it was the biggest beat stick that you could, you could bring out and it could trade off with a monarch. Yep. Those are the ones. Mm-hmm. Ill blood, Koki, Reaper, Pyramid Turtle, and zombie master. Yeah. Oh, oh. Medicine. What was your uh, one of your favorite decks uh, of the past? Of all time? Let's say, let's say all time, or at least give me like a top three of them. So the first answer might be surprising to people. Mm-hmm. I, I imagine if people were to guess, they'd say Heroes or Rabbit. But what honestly might be my favorite deck of all time mm-hmm. was Sylvans with triple soul charge. <laughs> so basically peak Sylvans, which is somewhat more yes. recent and modern than what people might anticipate. So I think that's maybe the 2013 nationals or 2013 yeah, nationals, uh, 20, 2014 nationals. I believe it, uh, no, yeah. 2013. Yeah. Cause I remember it being around in D- nationals in Detroit. I remember it being there. Uh, I can't remember if it was being, it was there the year before. As I'm trying so to it, think about Sylvan's it. was a one, a one off. Okay. So it wasn't, it was 2014 because 2013 Pat won with dragon ruler. So yes. it would have been 2014 with where Hat won. Mm-hmm. Yes. Or Corey, or Corey won with Hat. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because I, I remember Sylvan's was the one that knocked me out of that tournament in, in Detroit. So yeah, I don't have a, I don't get, I don't have good memories of that. Yeah, that is the only that. Nationals I ever topped was the one with Sylvan's in 2014. Oh, okay. So with funny story with that one, that was right around when I was finishing grad school. Mm-hmm. And one of the main reasons why I ever took a break in the first place was either starting my career and wanting to devote time to make sure that I I did my job well or finishing something like grad school. Well, that was after I finished grad school. During that summer, I had the opportunity to play. There was a ARG in Philadelphia or somewhere around Philly. I don't think it was actually in Philly, but it was in Pennsylvania. There was nationals and then there was an ARG in Columbus. So there's basically three premier events if you want to consider ARG premier events back to back to back and th- this was a time where actually my younger brother was playing Yu-Gi-Oh yep. and had been playing more than I was so he had all the Sylvan cards and he wanted to run something like Gear Gia so I ended up using his Sylvan cards at that first ARG event well I had never used the deck before all I knew was it played Lone Fire I loved Lone Fire mm-hmm. I knew the deck was pretty powerful I figured you know what my testing will be this event we'll see what happens I'll try and wing it and i ended up getting all the way up to top eight with the deck and yep. if you go back and watch on youtube me trying to work through the combos with the deck that i had no experience with it was actually pretty bad i'd mm-hmm. have like soul charge lone fire and end with a pretty bad board or a very inferior board but that was a useful event because i at least started to get used to the deck and then i went home and again i borrowed my brother's card so i lived at home at the time and i play tested with him and i goldfished the deck a bunch and i felt mm-hmm. like i really knew the ins and outs of the deck the combos at least mm-hmm. so then i went to nationals with it 
and I was always somebody that typically liked to play decks with a lot of traps. And this is during a format where I could have played Hat or even the Skill Drain Dragon Ruler deck. So there were a lot of trap heavy decks out there. Yes. But I just really latched onto that Sylvan deck. I really enjoyed working through the combos because a lot of modern combo decks, it's almost like an algorithm where mm -hmm. this is the set of sequences that you take. Mm -hmm. If they hand trap you, it points A, B, and C. This is the new chain of events that you go through. I really liked Sylvans and some of the older type of combo decks because every game it felt like there was a new iteration, a new path to victory. I think DDT was like that too, where you could win, but how you got there varied. And that's why I really liked that Sylvan deck. Yep. So that surprisingly might actually be my number one favorite deck of all time. <clears throat> yeah, because I, I believe the, during that ARG, I think you were featured in the in the final round of of that event. I think you were against Alexander Flamer. I think you guys drew, but I don't think he made it, but I think you made it into the top cut uh, with with that deck, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I was featured three times, and in none of wow. the three matches that I play particularly great. <laughs> Put it this way, in the top eight, somebody yeah. pointed out my hand was really bad in the top eight. Yeah, Not to use that as an excuse, but it was bad, and I had, a, I had the option of basically discarding end phase. But if I did that, I could have triggered Sylvan Sage Sequoia, or whatever it's called, the the one the that you can trigger tree. when it's the, the big, big tree, tree, not the yeah. hermit tree, the littler yeah. tree, the level seven. Yeah, the and it would have tree. actually walled against my opponent a little bit. And I yeah. never even realized that interaction. So I was mm -hmm. making even mistakes like that, that a little bit more of, of a minute mistake or a mistake that is easy to overlook, but yeah. not something that ever really dawned on me. But then mm -hmm. later on at Nationals and then the ARG in Columbus, I had way more confidence in the deck. There is a, another video on YouTube of me playing in Jerry Williams with Sylvans. Mm -hmm. And I do this like, 10 minute turn where I ditch Hermitry off of Aurea, which lets you stack the top eight cards of your deck. Mm -hmm. And then I like stack the top eight cards of my deck. And I mean, once you're stacking the top eight cards of your deck, you can just imagine the paths forward at that point with that deck. And I use Miracle Fertilizer four times on one turn because Aurea oh, bounced them all to my hand. Wow. And I use Soul Charge on that turn. And I, I mean, it was a pretty cool turn. Oh yeah. So by that point, I was more confident in what the deck could actually do. Yeah, because that's a ridiculous amount of recursion that you can bring from the graveyard. So, and, and there's no there's no cap on it. So, being able to bring it, like bounce it back and use it again, was it absolutely crazy. I mean, you have to forfeit your normal summon, but who cares if you're making twenty normal summons and not getting stopped by Max C? Nope. Or in my battle phase, I remember I played Soul Charge and four Miracle Fertilizers on that turn. Oh wow! Oof. Like I knew, like I, I knew that Sylvans were very deadly because they have this the, the stacking engine and like the recursion uh, to bring like big beat sticks out were absolutely crazy. Which is, and they they have like really cool like unique interactions with your opponent, which is why they were so powerful and, and really cool. And uh, it's and I, I didn't want to go against that deck when I was in Detroit. I'll, I'll tell you that much. My second favorite deck might actually be DDT though, which mm -hmm. might also be a little bit surprising. I yeah. ran DDT at the Shonen Jump in Philadelphia when I was something like sixteen years old during. Troop dupe format. Somebody yep. lent me the magical stone excavations. I had the D draws and all that, but not the stones. They were very expensive. Yep. And I went seven and three, which I felt really proud of at that age. I remember. <laughs> I remember going seven and three. Yep. And then my third favorite deck might honestly be of all things Insectors after Hornet and Dragonfly were limited. Yeah. Billy popularized that deck by topping an event. And I started playing it after that. And I really liked how people would underestimate what the deck could do. Mm -hmm. And then you would crash a Mystic Tomato and clear their whole field, even the Hornet and Dragonfly were at one. Mm -hmm. I just really liked how that deck could take advantage of, of the opponent who left themselves exposed to something like a Mystic Tomato or a Call of the Haunt and Mystic Tomato play. Mm -hmm. So surprisingly, I actually really liked that version of Insectors. Well, that what, what, could probably alter a little bit. If I thought about yeah. it more, I might be able to come up with a better one. Yeah, well, I really liked Insectors when it was, uh, when it was at three. So when Hornet and Dragonfly were at th because uh, they they, had a t they would have a tough match against Dino Rabbit, especially if they opened up like with Dolka instead of Lagia, which was, which always was problematic. I hate it when people do my deck and would just say, "All right, I'm going to bring out uh, Dolka instead," because the generic play would be Lagia be like that Omni negate. But oh yeah, if people knew that sure. you were, if, but if people knew that you were playing in sectors, you go right to Dolka and have a double negate, which just is even more problematic. But uh, I, let's explain the differences between like. Insectors before and Insectors with one Hornet because the, the deck was written off when we had one Hornet because that was the complete catalyst of the, of the deck and the thing and it was I believe it was uh it was SJC Philadelphia sorry YCS Philadelphia 
when uh, when we really had that like big matchup between Dino Rabbits and Insectors. I think, um, yeah, I think those are the two main decks that, that were out there. I think Heretics were also uh, kind of yep. had in a bit of appearance. Uh, Skill Drain Heroes. I lost to that one. Oh, did you? I oh. played all of these decks at that event. So I lost yeah. in the top four of that Shonen Jump or YCS. Yeah. I lost to Heretics. I remember vividly to this day. It's like game three. I open Rabbit going first, game three. Like, all right, I'm in good shape. And my opponent went, you know, Dark Hole, which forces out the negation. Yep. Heavy Storm, my two back rows. And then Heretic OTK'd me. Ugh. I vividly remember that. <laughs> and then I ended up going starting four and two and then one out. And then I eventually lost in the top four. But I beat probably four or five in Zector decks at that event. In Zector was a borderline buy. During the four or five times that I ran Rabbit, Mm-hmm. I legitimately went 13 and 0 against Insectors. Oh, nice. I never lost to it. I mean, I main deck macro for most of it, so that helps. I yep. always played oh Waiba, which also helps. Yes. But that matchup was so in favor of Dino Rabbit, it was crazy. It, it really is. And I, I'm actually surprised that when I played that, I was I, I was X2. I came 34, so that was the one YCS work. I thought I did top, but didn't. Like I actually won all my day two events. But I, my Jeez. only I lost to I lost to Windups in round three, and then I lost to Hanzo Laguero in, I think, round nine. It was the last round of day mm-hmm. one, but still made the top. He was the only loss that I had in Dino Rabbit, uh, but I was able to beat up all my matches. But I played so ballsy, by the way. It, like, Zet Caliber was probably one of the best cards to ever play against Oh, that card was that incredible. Deck. Yeah, that card was incredible. That was probably like the catalyst of playing against that deck, but I had to play so ballsy. But I always thought that Dino Rabbit definitely had the better matchup against Insectors than, than vice versa. In that deck, because uh, because Dolka is like the, the big game changer. If you put out Dolka, I I couldn't think of a way to really get around that aside from maybe like Hopper and Zet Caliber to kind of, to trade it off with. That's the only like easy thing I can think of to get to get it. And that's just a really difficult. Uh, that's difficult in itself just to open up with because you're probably waiting. Magia, yeah, macro. Uh, yeah. Oh my god, that that that, that just game. shuts the game. Yeah, that's that shuts the game and then, down. Out of the side, I always cited double Valor. So yeah. I would always I would always typically go Lagia first if I had mm-hmm. one of the three macros. And then you would use your Dust or MST on the macro. Mm-hmm. Like you'd force out Lagia with Dark Hole or something. Yeah. Or Book of Moon. Or I'd probably let you set it with Book of Moon. But you'd try and force out the Lagia negation. You'd use your one backer removal. You'd mm-hmm. finally summon the Insector. And you're like, finally, I got it through. And then I'd Veiler from hand, even though I was still having macro in my deck. Yeah. So even when you could break the macro, I was signing the Veiler, so... A lot of times I remember those matchups going where my opponent would feel like, yes, I broke the board. I can finally destroy everything. Yep. And they just veil it from hand. Yeah. And if you don't let your opponent get off like Hornet, like there's no way Insectors are winning because that's how like Hansel beat me. He, I didn't resolve a single Hornet at all. And, and it's not like it wasn't available to me. Like I did have choice and chances to get it, but he always took me out. And I think Overworked also was a really uh, popular side deck. I remember card. that one. Yeah. It was a really popular card at that time. Which uh, would take out Insectors because it, it, it's a trap card that takes out a monster that takes out all monsters that have attack that's orig- different from the original attack, and all the Insectors would be pumped by five hundred. So, and Dino Rabbits didn't really get that boost, so they they didn't care at no, all. I don't, I don't think my opponents got off their Hornet very frequently at all during that format. Mm-hmm. And if they did, it was you know targeting a set MST or something. I mean, it was one of those decks where I always felt like the Dino Rabbit deck was so much better. And it yeah. was just a matter of, can I leave them with a 1600 exposed for me to attack over Guaiba, or can I protect Macro? There was just so many things that needed to go right for Insectors to win. Yeah. They basically mm-hmm. needed the Rabbit player to open, like, Prison, Prison, Bottomless, and you have Dragonfly, and all normal monsters. That was about the only way that you were going to win. Yeah. Is if your opponent just had no reaction to your normal summon. And no macrocosmos. Because honestly, you could open five normals and macro and you probably win. Yep. Yeah. They you they really can't get over the thing. And then the only thing they can really pray for is maybe like a Zet Caliber and, and equipped to it's equipped like a centipede or a hopper and that's pretty much like at least they're saving grace for the most part. But other than that, if you open up macro and like a normal monster, like you're already you're probably winning. And then not so much you're running lances as well, which can also which or a huge counter for against the insectors at least in the sense of like being able to protect yourself in battle i i, I think you would sign up yep. in that case Dolka but... in defense yeah and it, it was in defense they can't yeah they can dark hole all they want you'll chain lance 
and, and then it was really tough, difficult for them to get over because odds are they're probably not making that equip or whatnot. And yeah, I don't know how I was able to beat so many Dino Rabbits minus against Hansel the girl, but then again, Hansel's a really skilled player in his itself, so I can understand why. But uh, other than that, I can see why you didn't have any problems against Insectors. I was still amazed that I even got that far to begin with with the deck that I had. But yeah, it was a good event. And I just one funny little bit of trivia. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure Final Countdown like was first after Swiss in that event. That may have been the case. That would have been. That would have, who was that? That was Tyler, I think, did that. Yeah, I, th- I think Tyler so. Jammin. Yeah, because I think I was, I was, I remember like him being around, and I'm like, I, I'm like, can I? I have to go against Final Countdown. Like, I think I'm gonna lose Final because when it, the name started being called off, I'm like, okay, I'm like not 30th, maybe I'm 31st, maybe I'm 32nd, maybe I gotta go against Tyler in Final Countdown. I'm like, that's not a matchup I want because I don't really have a lot of like stuff to counter that the Final Countdown. And then my name didn't get called, so I remember Tyler. Uh, uh, I don't want to say vividly, but I remember. Like, I know at least Final Countdown was at was at the top spot at that point in time. Yeah, for Nationals, which was the event after Philadelphia, I put a Fire Arts in my side deck. Yep. It was the water if you attributed a Fire Monster, it would basically bring a destruction your opponent. That deck would be willing to go down basically to one life point if it meant that you weren't able to reach your battle phase. Mm-hmm. So if you had Incidental Burn in your deck, you could drop your opponent below the threshold for a Fire Arts on a Lagia, that was your Fire Monster, yep. and then win the game that way. You basically needed some type of reach some type of incidental burn. That's that's a that's a really really tricky tech. Did that ever work for you at that event? I never played fight. I never played against Final Countdown. So. Okay. Oh, I, okay. I see what you mean. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I, it was I, a one card in the side deck for Final. Because in theory, you'd almost draw your whole deck against them if you actually let the game draw out. Yep. And then, all you needed to do was draw Fire Arts, and if you sequenced your attacks. You know, you say I'm entering battle phase and your opponent's like, well, I'm at 4,000. I don't care if they attack with Lagia. It's not like they can special summon in battle phase with Rabbit. Sure. And they'll see, save their Wabakus and their threatening roars and all of the other various cards that they have. Mm-hmm. But all you need to do is drop them within range and then fire arts them out. Yeah, because then I think uh, I think Hope for Escape was pretty prevalent around that time. They didn't, and they, they'd want their life points to go Oh, yeah, down. they'd want that for sure. As long as they have one life point, they can win. Yeah. But that's why you have the incidental burn in your deck. Yeah, because that's that's what they're expecting in in that case. Because they they want to keep drawing more and more with hope for escape. That's why they, they keep like de- like taking down so much of their own life points and not really care. Uh, and then hope for escape, and then they draw like five six cards, and then they pretty much have when when that whole thing resolves. So uh, I, I remember that being a thing. I think, uh, and that was also the same nationalist. I think uh, Pro Winston topped and then went to Worlds on with with Exodia, if I recall correctly. Yeah, he beat Jesse Samick, and to this day, I remember watching that match and thinking, I I remember it had something to do with like level limit area B, and I feel like if Jesse emphasized what that was doing to Jarrell, he might have been able to win that game three, mm-hmm. but Jarrell ended up winning. And oh oof, boy, and like I think like, Pro Winston was like he was like I know he was already famous, but I think like that really kind of helped like put him over the top in terms of popularity. And then I think he started his his YouTube channel around that time. And then like really, I think he had it before. Uh, I mean, even go back to let's say Edison that he topped with the yeah. Lightsworn Monarch deck. Yeah, I feel like he had his channel at that point in time too. Mm-hmm. Uh, that just could have been like his maybe his I don't want to say breakthrough moment, but maybe that was the the moment that kind of helped like put him over the top. And I think it was like one of like the hottest YouTubers at that point in time when uh, oh for sure w- when that when that happened. And like I I, I commend him for running Exodia on at Worlds because like he was he made top eight. I think he he could have had a chance, but I remember there was a there was like miscommunication with him trying to chain like a, a twister to a royal decree because the again an exector matchup, but. Uh, none the, like I think he could have won that, but I think he lost that as a result, even though he had like the perfect counter for it. And like it was a great meta call because Insectors virtually can do nothing against uh, like that that chain draw Exodia deck. It was it was insane. I loved watching that deck. Yeah, that was I remember watching those too. That was an interesting deck for sure. Mm-hmm. And how well did you do at that uh, at that nationals? By the way, I think it was in it was in Columbus, I believe that that nationals. Yeah, that that was the event that ended the streak that I had. I had seven straight premier tops in a row, and then yeah. that was the one that ended it. Oh boy! Oof. I did the old one two drop. One two drop. Okay, so I yeah I was I was pretty much the same, and I, I rarely go that, but I, I had my first loss just because the Dino player had 
opened up three Valor in uh, in game two, in game three. So I couldn't do a single thing, and I'm like, oh. I, I mean, it so happens. Upset. Yeah, it it, it happens. I, I, it's, I definitely it's went to the rabbit well one time too many. I mean, yeah. windups won that event. I think it was definitely the time where the format hit that perfect part, perfect point where windups is probably the deck to go with. But yeah. I mean, I had topped three, four events in a row with rabbit. It just felt like a natural decision. Yeah, I actually ended up losing to someone who I didn't know personally, but who was a friend of a friend who got my deck list mm -hmm. for that nationals and then ended up beating me round three not yeah. that my deck was that i mean it was dino rabbit it wasn't that big of it everyone knew what the deck looked like but yeah it had a tech compulse for nationals specifically unlike the previous mm -hmm. ones yeah and i remember him beating me game three with it yeah so that was kind of funny yeah that was uh, i also ran actually two copies of compulse at at philadelphia and i i think i said in my own deck profile uh, people asked me for it is like probably one of the best cards of the, of the day just because it was it, it was it was my out to Dolka in a sense because yep. you know because that was that's my problem card. What's the problem card? Dolka. How do I get rid of it? Like it compulsed. Yep. Uh, and and of course it was it was like a temporary no more priority counter. too. Yeah, and it was like a temporary counter to like against the mirror match as well. So like if they equip a equip on the exact oh yeah, that's all you yeah, need. Yeah, throw it back. But it can bounce then... wind up Zen Maddie too. Yeah, and that Prior was all... yes. Yeah, after priority, which is all that matters yeah it, and it, that was a big and that was a big card too because like it was really difficult for insectors to kind of like beat over beat over that because i think it was like what 20 22 23 defense 23 defense i believe no, no zen maddie the oh zen maddie oh the oh, flip down oh, oh right am i using a, the one that searches from the deck the one that combos you oh, okay yeah yeah yeah. you're right zen maddie i was thinking of zen mains for some reason zen mains yeah 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 well zen mains yeah zen mains could be annoying depending on how many hornet effects you can get off yeah, it was Zen Maddie, the one that looped your whole hand. Mm -hmm. And then and now we let's and then going to Insectors. Now that they went to one, uh, I I stopped playing Insectors at that point because I thought they were dead. So yep. I I got rid of all my Insectors. Now I, I'm a little bit hazy on it. So could you explain to me with Insectors how they were able to operate with just one? Okay, morning? for sure. So shown or YCS Columbus. I guess this is 2012, something in that vicinity. Billy comes to me or we're talking with Billy over dinner and we're asking each other what we're running. And he's like, I'll, I'll tell you right when we leave. And I remember I was like, all right, Billy, what are you going to run? And he's like, Insectors. And then he ran off and we're all like, all right, yeah, right. You're going to run Insectors, one <laughs> Hornet, one Dragonfly. Yeah. And lo and behold, the next day, there's Billy with his Insector deck, makes it mm -hmm. to the top, top 32. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, it's public knowledge what his deck looks like. It's no surprise. And it is exactly what you think. It is Insectors with one Hornet and one Dragonfly. Mm -hmm. And what he did is he took those monsters and replaced them with Mystic Tomatoes and Call of the Haunteds. Mm -hmm. And he didn't even run Tour Guide, which was somewhat surprising because Tour Guide gets Sangin detached Sangin said Call was actually pretty decent because it would give you access to a Sangin, which could give you yeah. the Hornet or the Dragonfly. But just Tomato was good enough because if your opponent puts any monster on the board and you crash Tomato, you can either get Hornet or you get Dragonfly. Yep. And if you have either Hornet or at that point Ladybug, which he ran three copies of, that was basically full combo. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of times where the Mystic Tomato would wall your opponent. They wouldn't want to attack it. And then you would just crash. And then you'd have sometimes call the Hornets. And sometimes you'd go Mystic Tomato, crash, get Sangin, crash, get Dragonfly, call yeah. the Haunted Tomato, <laughs> crash Tomato, get Dragonfly, blow up yep. your field. Yep. And that's all you needed. And then mm -hmm. I ended up actually using Insectors at the following event in providence the ycs in providence i had been using that deck a while and i actually played and beat billy the first round with yeah. that deck which was kind of funny in an zector and zector mirror match yeah i didn't end up topping that one but oh. but it was fun to play in zectors at least once I, I do have to thank billy for that uh because he he ran uh he sided messenger of peace which i thought was one of the best cards to uh, side brilliant. against dino dino rabbit and then i emulated that myself but uh, st strange enough, I so before Safe Zone came popular, I actually ran Safe Zone in my in my Insector decks because when I read the effect, I'm like, this is amazing. I'm like, if I can pr just protect one Insector off this effect, like that's it. I'm Game's launching. Over. I'm launching every single turn, and I, 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 I'm not trying to take anything away from Billy, but I believe I got that before him. But he was, but he did popularize it before I did. But I remember running like safe zone with my insectors i'm pretty sure it's in my philly deck list somewhere but that card was so amazing and and i would play it all the time and it's like yeah you're not getting 
anything off. And it was just fun using it on a dragonfly, popping everything or on a centipede. It's like, I'm searching my entire deck. There's like so many pluses, like crazy. But again, like, I'm sure, like, obviously, Billy didn't take it from me. He thought of it on himself, <laughs> too. So, like, like, he had like a great train of thought as well with Safe Zone. And I think he, he popularized that, too, along with uh, Messenger of Peace in the side deck, because that was a fantastic side deck card for for against dinos and I, that's how i won majority of my dino matches was with messenger of peace so uh props to him for that and uh also the day before that philly i also thought of soul taker because like that was another great card that was uh mm-hmm. that was under the radar and use and I, I think i was in i was traveling to uh from like, i live in canada so i'm like close to toronto and i traveled all the way to syracuse because i was traveling with my friends from there to the event which is like a four-hour drive and i stopped by their local and picked up a bunch of soul takers i'm like thank god I need these soul tickets for the event and got it in for the event. So again, I'm getting off track, but that, that was a, uh, I can't believe the insectors actually was able to top during that time. And the, the other uh, cool thing about the, that deck is he started uh, like, I think, Oh, he only ran one solemn judgment in that deck. I think well, you can only run one solemn judgment. Oh, was Oh yeah. That's right. That was part of the, that was part of the hit. Was it not? Cause it was at three when we were talking about back in Philly. No, Solemn Judgment was at one for like the longest time, was it? Yeah, oh. I don't remember the exact time it went to one off the top of my head, but it was definitely not a three during Dino Rabbit format, or I would have played three in Dino Rabbit. Yeah, for I was sure. gonna say it's like yeah, pretty, it's pretty hazy. Pretty, you know, that's what happens. It gets a little hazy at this point in time. But I do have I, a funny story though about Messenger of Peace. If you've heard yeah. my content or listened to my content, you probably heard this story before. But mm-hmm. when Photon, I never pronounced this card's name correctly, but Papillotoperative. Oh, oh, whatever oh, it's papil- called. Oh, papillooperative. 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 <laughs> sure. However yeah. you pronounce it, whatever it's called. John Weigel told me that you could use it on your own monsters. And yeah. at the time, I didn't think that was a big deal. This was right before the YCS in Philadelphia. Yeah. Little did I know that basically four months later, that would become a pivotal part in a new wind up combo that yeah. Patrick Oben used. But that's a different story. Mm hmm. When it first came out, though, on the eve of Philadelphia, he pointed that out to me. And I said, well, I don't think I'd ever really need, like, what's the point of that? Well, then, lo and behold, round five or six at the YCS in Philadelphia, there's my Insector opponent with Messenger of Peace out. Mm -hmm. What I was able to do was summon Photon. Not even going to try to pronounce the rest of its name. (laughs) I shifted my Levier from attack to defense mode and then used my guy to shift the Levier back to attack mode and it dropped its attack from 1800 to a thousand permanently Mm -hmm. which meant now it could attack underneath my opponent's messenger of peace and i had a neospatian grand mole and this is the insector matchup yeah and this was one of those game states where he had messenger while i had like lagia with negations macro i had the whole lock going but i can't Mm -hmm. obviously attack under messenger but now i can my mole can keep bouncing the set in Zector that he sets every turn, and my yeah. Levier can attack directly for a thousand every turn. Yeah. So oh. I played around my opponent's messenger. Oh wow! I I never seen like a Papal Operative actually be used in in that sense. So that's that's actually a cool piece of trivia that I I that completely blew my mind because I knew they played it, but I never seen it be used in that fashion before. I think everyone. I mean, it was used program. generally just to kill Reaper. That was what it's used for. Yeah. And then after when windups got their first limitation and hunter got banned it was used during a magician shark combo to shift your wrath that you special summoned out of your deck to attack mode mm-hmm. and then you could shock master just off shark magician yeah because yeah because well you they, they abuse and wind up rat like crazy i remember that like being part of the combo as well and uh and like and, and i've had it used against me as well because like capital offer was actually like a really powerful card for for windups at that time and then we started seeing uh, I think this was post loop, uh, post wind up hunter loop. If I recall. Yeah, or, after yeah. hunter got banned, the new combo mm-hmm. was with, with just one Zen Matty to go into Shockmaster. Yeah, and and then it was like it was like, but Magician Shark was still like really prevalent because that was like part of like that was part of like the big setup because if you opened up basically both of those and then you're you're basically going off at that point in time. Yeah, so Josh Graham won the first YCS in that new format in Toronto with yep. the Magician Shark, or Tour Guide Shark, I think, probably got somewhere close to it. But you'd get Magician out of your deck. Well, you'd summon Magician Shark, and you'd get Rat out of your deck, and the Rat typically comes in defense mode off of the Magician. Mm-hmm. But then you could go into Papiloperative, or however it's pronounced, and shift the Rat to attack mode, and then use the Rat at that point again. Mm-hmm. 
a Ralph for the first time. It just came out of your deck, but now it went from defense to attack. And now because yep. it's an attack, you can use Rat's Effect and you'd end on Shockmaster. Yeah, because I remember I was judging that event and Shockmaster was being like asked like crazy on like the, the pre-registration day, which was, I, I don't like the pre-registration. It was actually at like a, a nearby hotel that was like away from the actual convention center. It was a completely different spot of where it was. I don't know if you were there and if you pre-registered at that day or not. I was but, there. I was there for sure. Yeah. And that was, I think it was the first time that we actually had like a pre-reg that was like away from the actual event itself. It wasn't in the same building because, but that was the hotel without where the judges were staying. So I think that's why they just, they opted to do it. They're just to save on costs. Uh, and then, and then Shockmaster was used. And I'm pretty sure Graham beat uh, Jeff Jones who ran that like really tricked out psychic deck in the finals. Yep. But, but he got locked yep, out. He sure did. Shock, but he got locked up because of Shockmaster, which was like the card of the day. It sure was. <clears throat> I remember on the drive to that event, I'm typically the person that does the driving. I typically can do the late night driving. Yep. And at, let's say, two, three, four in the morning, it dawned on me. I was just thinking about cards, like, what deals with the Shockmaster loop? And it dawned on me. I was like, needle sailing. If you set needle sailing and they Shockmaster you, just flip it during their standby phase. And it kills the Shockmaster and all the monsters they put on the board. Yeah. So I remember I told everybody sort of close to me about how good needle sailing was. So that was one of the good outs to Shockmaster was mm -hmm. to just set needle sailing, even if they went first and then flip it during the standby phase. Mm -hmm. I remember the, the, that event too was uh, Gear Gear just, just came out. Uh, I knew wind-ups were, pre were prevalent. I, I, I said wind ups were going to be the, the deck of the one. Uh, I remember, oddly enough, Jing Shen Hu was also uh, a tech card that was being used that day as well, which uh, to like kind of stuff all the back rows. I remember seeing that one being surfaced a lot, but that deck that Jeff Jones ran, that psychic deck, even to this day, like, I, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I, I'm still baffled by how that how that deck actually worked. I don't know if you ever got like any close looks at, at that deck, but holy jeez, I think that one caught everybody off guard. Which was that? Oh, the it, is it yeah, was like it was a psychic deck that like utilized Grand Soil. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Jeff's deck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I thought yeah, for sure. Yeah, it used Grand Soil. It used I think it even summoned Psychic Nightmare sometimes from the extra deck. Yeah, it was a really cool deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it had a lot of weird cards in it, but yeah. Grand Soil was definitely. I think that was the only time Grand Soil was ever really competitive. Yeah, because it really wasn't used a whole lot afterwards. They, they, then, like, it just got overshadowed by uh, Mulan Glacier with uh, Mermails, and I think that was mm. that was pretty much it. I don't I recall any other of the uh, the element of Lords actually being of like actual use at that point. It was just those two. I don't think any of the other ones ever saw play. Yeah, the I, wind I, one I, is Harpies. That's not very good. The, yeah. the fire one is like a Ring of Destruction effect. Yeah. I can't, and I, then I the get... wind, wind, fire, water. I don't remember what the other one is. Yeah, the, there was a light one. I think that came with um, the, the, they came with like a much like a newer set. I think it was like flame, flames of destruction, but uh, it was it wasn't very good at all. I, I don't think so. But yeah, like the the elemental was really didn't really didn't do a whole lot outside of uh, Mulan Glacier and uh, Grand Soil. Yeah, those uh, are the yeah, big two. Yeah, those are the big two, and th that was that was quite an event itself, and I. So let's fast forward a bit now because um, you said you haven't played for a while, but you kind of came back into it like uh, before the pandemic. And like, what? Uh, when did you take your break in the game? So that's a good question. I mean, I took a few breaks. I would say I stopped routinely attending locals religiously when I started grad school. Mm hmm which would have been somewhere around May of 2013, somewhere in that vicinity. Yeah. Now I went to some nationals. I still went again to the dragon ruler spellbook nationals. I went to the Silva nationals. I went to the Necroz nationals. I still would come back for nationals, but in some case, like the Necroz nationals, I had to LCQ. So it yeah. wasn't something like I was playing religiously. And then I would say the really prolonged break that I took was right before pendulums came out i remember in some of the last events that i attended people were talking about the pendulum mechanic yep i guess technically i was around for the necroz nationals which means i played against the cliffords deck but i didn't play against it more than just once or twice yeah but somewhere i guess in and around that time probably around the necroz i think the nationals after necroz was the first nationals that i that i didn't attend 
So I guess 2015 is the Necroz. I definitely was at that Nationals. So it mm -hmm. must be 2016 is going to be the first Nationals that I did not attend. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, Domain Monarchs. I'm looking this up now. I've never played a game in my life against Domain Monarchs. Yeah. Oh, God, that was that. that I that's all about it all i wasn't a fan i wasn't a fan of uh those monarchs they weren't they weren't fun to play against and i, I they weren't the originals them. yeah they weren't the originals and like you barely played any of the originals in it so it, it didn't feel like real monarchs to me in a sense and it was more uh more like lockdown it didn't feel like a, mm -hmm. like a really good back and forth i mean i i'm not saying i didn't have any good games with it but i i really detested the way that that kind of uh locked down because it was more like a lot of people can just okay throw up domain and just win, as opposed to like really skillfully being able to like articulate your way through like your opponent's fields. It's just okay if I can throw up a domain and my opponent's not playing monarchs and playing like something relies on the extract, like you can win like half your games with that easily. So that was, I wasn't a big fan of that format. I've gone back and watched. I, one of the things that I did when I first started playing again, let's say at the end of 2019. Mm -hmm which feels like so long ago now that we've been living through this pandemic. But yeah, at the end of 2019, when I started to get back into the game, is I tried to go back and watch deck profiles and videos to try and catch up on what those, let's say, four or five years were like, mm -hmm. which had some benefit to it. It was fun to go back and watch, let's say, what obviously Domain Monarchs did, what Pendulum decks looked like, what the Pepe deck looked like at its full strength. Uh, Giski, I think it was called, had a pretty cool deck for a little while. I went back and watched and tried to learn what I missed. Yeah. Because that was definitely one of the disadvantages when I first started playing again, pre-COVID was. Everybody had been playing Link formats and understanding the importance of your zones was definitely something that took a little while. Yeah. Uh, I that all, I was also a little bit baffled by how that's really started to take place when it, when it first came out. Yeah. Poor design, if you ask me. I think that's yeah, I, I, I'm i not a fan a of A barrier to entry, which I don't think is beneficial. A huge barrier. Nobody likes when they feel like they're playing the game properly to be told, oh, no, that's a mistake. And that's what links do and the zones do. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to have somebody who's just learning the game to have that gotcha moment. Like, oh, you put that in the wrong zone. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the zones make it more likely that that happens. And for a newer player, that might be a deterrent. They might quit on their first week of playing the game because they keep making mistakes about zoning. So yeah. I feel like from a philosophical standpoint and a game design standpoint, it was a pretty big mistake. Yeah. I, 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 they had to reduce something to reduce the power of pendulum. So they backed themselves into a corner. Yeah. And, and but, but by virtue of doing that, they, in trying to nerf the nerf, like other parts of the game, they really, like buff the game in a sense where they kind of made like every single monster now can has potential to be like part of a link summon and just it, it broke the game wide open in a sense in my mind it did when they tried to kind of like nerf or at least like take it down a peg i think it did the complete opposite of what it was supposed to do yeah anytime that the field locations matter it just mm -hmm. creates for an unfun experience like you yeah. can activate a card and be like oh you're activating that in the column where i played infinite impermanence and you're like, oh, well, I'm not really using the zones on my mat, but it's just an unfun experience. I remember one of the first locals I went to, there was an argument over that. Yeah. Like, oh, you activated that in the column of my infinite impermanence. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, like, oh, how, how ridiculous is this? Is this really what people argue about now at locals Yeah. in these pretty insignificant games? Like, even if, he, even if your opponent did, who cares? Just let him or let her take it back. What's the big deal? Yeah. But I just... I mean, that's just obviously where the game is now. And from a game design standpoint, from a philosophical standpoint, you, I think you cut out of me for a second there. Oh, do you hear me now? Yeah, I heard you. I said, I heard from a philosophical standpoint, that was the last thing I heard. Oh, so I'm just saying from a philosophical standpoint, I think it creates an unfun experience. Yeah, and we, I remember when like, zones matter. Yeah, and when uh, we we had like a very tiny experiment of uh, of that way back when Cyber yeah, Impact Cyber Dark Impact, out, yeah, and sure. we, we had like set it like set it switch where you could like move the position of one card. Yeah. It really didn't care so much. It didn't think, matter. Yeah, it didn't really matter. And I think I I jokingly played around zones when that set came out because I remember one person at a just at one event decided to play blasting fuse because everybody was just setting all their cards in the same zone so people yeah. so he would just match everything up and then just kind of that would be like a gotcha moment like kind of thing and it was it was funny. i remember 
people were like, okay, zones matter now. You have to declare what, and for a little while, people were a little bit more vigilant about that. Like yeah. what zone is that in? And then once everyone realized that none of those cards were playable, it went back to, all right, let's T-set wherever the heck on my board I want. Yeah, and, and then it was a common thing, even though you're not supposed to te- technically, it oh, would I know, be yeah. common for people to like, okay, I'm going to move this card over here to this zone, move this zone, just kind of get like, Oh, yeah, yeah, people would. Of... Yep, so it became a thing where judges would look out for that. And now, let's say a year later when nobody played any of those cards. Same thing is true with Question, if you're familiar with that card from Veronica yeah. Guardian. Like, yeah. You're not supposed to manipulate your graveyard. Like, what if they play Question? Like, yeah, but come on now. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. And that was like in the, the documents where like, okay, you're not allowed to manipulate your graveyard or anything like that. And then, then it's just funny how like all like the whole like one ruling, sorry, one card can like completely like put like, the, I know. like a ruling that people play Monster like, Born monster. and they shuffle yep. the two options to the top of their graveyard to look at them. And yeah, we do that. That people do that at events. People do that without getting called out. But there were a few little periods of time where people were a little bit more vigilant, like, hey, question just got printed. Let's not be doing that anymore. Or yep. Senate switch is legal. You can't do that anymore. Yep. It's just it's just one of those things where it's like this this little arbitrary, like random little thing, but it's gonna dictate uh it's gonna dis- everything. dictate everything at all. And it's that it's was in the like, player meetings of regionals. I remember going to regionals right when Cyberdark Impact came out. And yeah. that was in the player meetings. Like you cannot move cards around your board once you place them there. That's it. Yeah. And it just felt like so much, so much time and effort wasted on something so minuscule and insignificant, and it's kind of like got like a now it matters for real, yeah. And like, like, like have like the big collective room of like eye rolls and everything. It's like, oh my god, why do we have to like adjust like uh, the uh, like yep. completely how we play for one? It's an arbitrary thing. Unfun, we're not yeah. Change. I think all it, changes in the game mechanic should be for fun, and I think making zones matter was an unfun change yeah and then ever since then like i i don't know if you're familiar with the deck called mech knights or not I yep. don't know if you're i'm familiar. totally yeah. familiar with them yeah so i can never I, beat them yep and now i always like ever since that happened like i'm like okay now i'm like all my zones are separate they're always oh, like in different zones too i for think sure. I, I did it in jest before because of blasting fuse with that I, I did it for fun and people were like, why put it in that zone? I'm like, oh, I'm, just in case of blasting fuse. It was just a laugh. It was a joke. But now it's like, okay, now I have to do it for real now. There's legitimate strategy in placing it. And the game is already like complex and difficult as it, enough as it is. For and sure. When you're adding an extra yep. element into it, that's that just feels so needless in my mind. It's, yep. like, it's I, a don't barrier need, to entry. Yeah. Like you don't need a to. A new like, player? Mm-hmm. Like you're telling me I have to read what's it called the the pendulum magician card that has like 800 lines of text yes and i have to worry about my zones it's just a lot for a new player to learn yep which i actually don't think is the case if we go back to 2006 7 Yu-Gi-Oh. it's actually pretty simple yeah and i think that more simplistic back and forth prolonged game is actually way more enjoyable and i think it's easier to learn it, yeah, I, I think so too because I, 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 this has been a recurring thing that's been coming on my podcast a lot is how like today's Yu-Gi-Oh like requires like 10, 15 elaborate turns of memorization and maybe like and flow charts or like how to like different trees to get to like a certain place where uh, as opposed to Yu-Gi-Oh way back when is where like, okay, we can adapt this, this kind of play style. We can decide, okay, we want to commit this many cards to the board or not because it was so taboo in, in my mind way back in the day where if we can like, overextend the board, we put so many cards in the field, we get punished for that. But now it's kind of the opposite. It's where like, no, now let's put all our cards on the table and see if my opponent can beat that. Like we used to, we used to chastise that kind of play way back then. Like that's the way to play now. Everything was an 8,000 point swing or everything is now an 8,000 point swing. Like if you don't invest those cards, your opponent more than likely is going to be able to just beat you. Yeah. And as a result, sometimes you just quote unquote overextend by virtue of what the game is like. But 15 years ago, 10 years ago, what's the worst thing that can happen? <laughs> there isn't much. Yeah. You're going to get another draw phase. You're going to survive. You're going to keep playing. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I had this discussion with like Paul Levitin about like if you have a bad hand in in, in Yu Gi Oh way back when you can at least kind of utilize a play style to maybe draw the game out like maybe you can like set up a bunch of bluffs oh, in sure. the back row like set up monsters like play very defensively until you draw to the stuff you need but now the game was like okay what's your opening hand if it's not good then that that's it you're you're, you're probably going to be pooched for the rest of the game for probably the and that could be a loss right there just because you drew poorly. 
in a sense. And like at least like good the better players can know how to play like out of better hands. Of course, like where you like you can still play out of bad hands in current Yu-Gi-Oh, but it's not as often and odd as prevalent as before where if you had like a bad hand. Like remember if you remember, I think it was Columbus, uh, like Billy Break in the finals when he was going against Alistair. He had yep, triple tango. Triple tango. But it's still it's won. just a different I mean, there is a ton of skill, and I have all the respect in the world for the modern players that are successful. Yeah. But a lot of it is, okay, this is the turn. This turn one is the turn. And I'm going to sequence these cards to play around what my opponent has, account Mm -hmm. for X amount of hand traps, account for X amount of negations, and I will establish board dominance, and I will win the game. And there's a ton of skill in that. Yeah. But it, it is looking at five or six cards, looking at your opponent's board and then finding a way to sequence your cards effectively to break the board now that has existed in older Yu-Gi-Oh too Mm -hmm. there was a aspect of that in Tengu plants there was an aspect of that in variants of X-Sabers and Insectors there are aspects of okay I need to break my opponent's board how am I going to sequence this Mm -hmm. but I feel like when two combo decks in modern Yu-Gi-Oh play against each other that's really all it is it's all right let's do these couple first turns the Mm -hmm. turns are going to take 15-20 minutes but we're going to see who can break each other's board Mm-hmm. In earlier Yu-Gi-Oh, I felt like you'd get to that point, but it would take you two or three or four turns to set your opponent up and be like, okay, this is the turn. I'm dust tornadoing, setting this end phase, creature swapping here. Play- you know what I mean? Like you would break the board, but I felt mm-hmm. like there was more setup. Now a-, a lot of it is, all right, what are my six cards? Maybe seven cards after I prosperity or desires or extravagance, and then now let's try and break my opponent's board. And I-, I like the drawn out planning of older Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. And it, and that's that's the same thing with me too. I, I like that because I like to like meticulously like plan out my moves and you know like maybe pick them apart like a little bit at a time or because my style way back when was I would play incredibly defensive, let my opponent like kind of come in at me and then exhaust the resource and then then go on the attack. Like the kind of like the rope a dope like Muhammad Ali strategy. That's what I yep. would like to do in a sense. But now that like I, it's it's really a lot harder for me to to do that in a sense unless I'm running like a complete floodgate deck. But I don't see a lot of merit or value in playing those kinds of decks right now. I would rather play a, a slightly more like combo based that can kind of handle like those kinds of decks per se. But like way back then, like I feel like I could express myself more uh, my own play style a little bit more way back then as opposed to now where it's just. Uh, it's a completely different game at this point in time the way it was now than, than what compared to what it was 15 years ago for sure. I definitely like that. Just, I mean, generally speaking, I like to play more defensive, let my opponent make the first push and then try and respond to it. It yep. always depends on your hand. Sometimes, obviously, situations warrant altering your game plan. Yep. But I think by and large, I typically have that mindset too of let my opponent make the first commitment. I'll try my best to break what my opponent does. Yep doesn't always work that way but by and large i feel like that was a a play style that i tried primarily during my days yeah exactly that i mean of course you're not going to do it every single match but that but you know you could have a style and play to it but of course there's certain situations where you would okay not do that like i remember when i like going back to that that philly ycs that i almost topped um there would be so many times where i'd actually like set four or five back row and but none of them would be solemn judgment because I would, because I, I was just trying to, I was just trying to bluff it. Because uh, when you're at that at a higher level of play, if you're setting that many back row, people are assuming, okay, there's got to be a solemn judgment in that, in, in that setting, or else they're not going to set. Or road, many. yeah, or road, yeah, in that sense, like none of, like one of those twos are going to be there. So therefore, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pl- like play into a heavy storm, and uh, you know, and I, I wouldn't do that every time. But I do that sometimes, just like as a mix up. Of course, it's depending on my hand, but, but it's that kind of play style that I like to. D- that I like to do, you know, like play to how I like to play. Maybe sometimes I like to bluff that I have so many back rows that I don't have a solemn. I can just kind of fetter on or play defensive and let someone come at me. Or, or if I need them to slow down, I'll pretend that I have all those back rows. So that way I can draw into what I need because again, insectors were very dependent on being able to have a Hornet. And if you don't have a Hornet in your opening draw, well then you've got, you're against the wall until you can finally get that Hornet. And that's, that would be an example of how I would like to play, but I, I can't really do that style, style now in today's Yu-Gi-Oh. No, not really. I mean, there are some decks. I don't want to discredit all of modern Yu-Gi-Oh, yeah. but certainly by and large, and you're playing in something like Dragon Link, it's kind of boom or bust on that first turn. Yeah. When you're playing against that Gishki deck from a few years ago, or Goku, not Gishki, Goku. 
I think uh, I said Goki, that incorrectly Goki, earlier. Goki, Goki, yeah, that yeah. calm, like the you summon. I mean, sometimes it's just do or die. Mm -hmm. You don't have the opportunity to. There was a like a burning abyss combo deck not too long ago that mm -hmm. had like I'm not talking about advanced the rock deck but it had block dragon in it like block dragon burning abyss that oh, was yeah, basically 100 percent monsters like monster mash yep yep or the rock deck a lot of times that's what modern Yu-Gi-Oh has become or spirals is another great example it's just do or die on that first turn oh yeah. i don't like those mm -hmm. those do or die turn one do you have it or do you not mm -hmm. i just if we can just play back and forth for a little while yep and then maybe set up a cool combo that's that's sweet i like when yep. the combo cards are trap cards I like when the combo card is Gotham's Emergency Call or Return, where it feels like there's a little bit more play to that. Not yeah. just opening turn, 14 normal summons, I have three negates and two bounces. Yeah, because everything is like now, now, now. That's that's what it kind of is, where it's like, you don't really, uh, where like back then it was like, okay, we can, we can afford like a turn or two to kind of do everything. Because I, I always tried to, like nowadays, like when I go first, like I, I would, I'd set in trap cards, but if I second i would took the side out a lot of trap cards now before like new annoying it didn't matter I was, still, I was still keeping trap i would still keep in trap cards. i wouldn't i would side in maybe more traps even if i knew i was going second because i knew that i could afford myself those turns like for example if i play like gear gear i'm like okay my i'm playing a whole trap deck here i can like add these traps add these traps even if i'm going second because you know it, it's a slow roll game but it's they kind of lose a lot of value if you if you can't use them first turn, and that's like the only traps that are like mainly being used if you're going second. Is that is there any first turn utility with that trap card? Like like an infinite no. impermanence. If not, you're they're probably coming out because every single card you play has to be has to have some kind of immediate value in a sense. For sure, and it's a it's definitely a modern deck building philosophical change that happened. I think a lot of it has to do with Patrick Hoban. Hoban yeah. popularized a lot of that theory mm -hmm. about making it so there's virtually no traps in your deck unless it's something like a floodgate in which case mm -hmm. it does sort of have utility on the first turn yep and a lot of the modern decks have really capitalized on that so that's mm -hmm. why we can play that's why the band list can have three solemn judgment three solemn warning three solemn strike three torrential three of everything that was once limited and not yep. really matter i mean there were times where we had bottomless a two or at one and torrential yep. at one and mirror force at one and judgment at one and warning mm -hmm. at one because mm -hmm. Yu-Gi-Oh! 15 years, not 15, but Yu-Gi-Oh! 8 years ago, there were a lot of power trap cards and people battled out with trap cards, yeah. which I really enjoyed. Yes, I, I, re I really did too. Like, and I, and it, it, it's a great feeling to be able to like fight through an opponent's board and then getting a win, especially when it's a long grind. Like, I think that's one of the most like rewarding wins you can have in Yu-Gi-Oh! is like, actually having like, a real battle yeah. with, with your opponent and like fighting through, being able to trade off on it so meticulously and, and, and skillfully and like getting those wins. Like, I love playing against the like the very slow decks. Like, even if like when I was running, when I was going against Gladiator Beast decks, like beating those decks was very satisfying. In my mind, yeah, all of those. I mean, there was times where Heavy Storms ban, True Nade is at one. Mm -hmm. True Nade doesn't really punish you for setting a lot of cards, but then there's Trap Stun, and you can yeah. set up. And I'm thinking a lot with X Sabers, where you just yeah. set up the right turn and you Trap Stun them, mm -hmm. and then you'd High Unlay them, and then that would just shift the course of the game. Those are formats I really enjoyed, yeah. where it was back and forth, and you sort of pinpointed that, okay, this is my opening, mm -hmm. this is my opportunity, and then you made a big shift or big, whether it's a tempo swing or just a big play, and you'd win the game because of it. Mm -hmm. But it would take you multiple turns to set up, and you're thinking three or four turns ahead. That's mm -hmm. the Yu-Gi-Oh that I really personally enjoy. And yep. again, no disrespect to people who have been successful in the last five or six years, yep. who have mastered these combo decks. There is an infinite amount of skill in memorizing the decision trees that are necessary and how to shift your sequence mm -hmm. when your opponent hand traps you at certain points. There's a ton of skill in that too. But if you're going to play a deck that, generally speaking, can accomplish its entire game plan on the first turn, mm -hmm. it's generally not a type of Yu-Gi-Oh I, I enjoy. Mm -hmm. I don't the, want your deck to achieve its full game plan on the first turn. Yeah, before you even have a chance, because it's not not every hand you're going to be able to open up a hand trap to be able to like disrupt your opponent. And even if you do open up a hand trap, that it may not be enough because we've seen. Yeah, I mean, you go back to Tengu Plant. It's I had this realization, honestly, this week playing Tengu Plants, mm -hmm. but I was thinking to myself, what is the worst thing my opponent can do in Tengu Plants going first? Yeah. It's basically opening one-for-one one Dandy Debris, which is an incredible 
three card single, all yep. limited to one combo, which definitely means I want Maxi going first. Mm -hmm. But what is the worst thing my opponent can do? Basically nothing on the first turn. So mm -hmm. Maxi is still obviously playable, obviously great card against Tengu plants. Yeah. But there was that comfort in thinking, I'm having a turn. I was running an x Saber trap deck and I'm like, my opponent's going first, but I'm going to have a turn. I don't have to worry about hand looping. I don't have to worry about anything. Yeah. So I'm actually, I'm, I'll still put it in my deck, mm -hmm. but I can rely on the fact that my deck has 15 traps in it because I'm going to get a turn. Mm -hmm. It was a good feeling. Yeah. And then the fact that you can, you're basically, your opening could be one of like maybe like 10, 15, like 20 different outcomes. Like you could, you could have like a different combination of, of opening turns uh, with playing plant tank format as opposed to like maybe current formats where they say like, this is the best board that you could possibly make. This yep. is what you've got to do to get to it. Yep. And as opposed to before, it's like maybe maybe my first turn is I'm just going to summon a Tengu set with a back on end. Maybe I'll summon Thunder King. That's going to be my first turn. Maybe I'll, I'll set Dandelion. Like there's a combination of different plays that you can make opening turn with like plant Tengu format. And, you know, and it, it's, it's dependent on your style. It's dependent on your matchup. And you just say, okay, this is how I'm going to play it. But most decks, not every single deck, like in current format is like, oh, yeah, get to this, there's get to this board, man. There's still, still like, Lich, a little bit. There was a yeah. zoo deck pretty recently, but the last deck I played in person was the dragon link deck from last year and yeah. if you drew the proper combination of cards you would do the exact same play the exact same sequence of maybe 20 total plays using the exact same i think it was 12 extra deck monsters mm -hmm. and you would leave yourself with three in the extra deck and you'd end with Borload savage dragon unchained abomination you would have like a rocket tracer and a heretic seal like that would be your perfect turn one play yeah, but it was like that's the one thing the deck does. It uses virtually the entire extra deck to achieve this one singleton sequence of plays. But the deck was really good at doing it, and it did it basically on the first turn almost every game. Yeah, I don't know that. That's not really Yu-Gi-Oh to me. It's like you have one thing your deck will always do on the first turn using every possible thing in your deck. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind if you could accomplish that type of play after. 15 turns or five turns even like let's go yeah. back and forth a little bit mm -hmm. i like you when you have to earn the combo like that yeah like like if you had to like for example if like we had to do like the x saber loop a little bit like the if you ever actually wanted to do like the x saber like discard loop with like regigura if you ever actually want it, it'd take a little time to set up uh, okay. yeah the best thing you could do the most unfun thing you could do when rescue cat was legal was cat double full troll because yeah. they would discard your opponent's whole hand. Yeah. Because you would Brian act the full trolls back. Mm -hmm. So you would like cat for Dark Soul and Air Bellum, summon double full troll. And then you'd use the four cards in your hand to bounce the full troll back to your hand and you'd hit your opponent's whole hand and you'd get five searches. Okay, yeah. that's not fun. But you're playing one rescue cat, two or three full trolls. What are the odds of you drawing that exact yeah. sequence of cards? There's, it's there's virtually two, zero. Two yeah, there's too many one ofs to be able to get that. It's like as you said, the the whole like debris dragon, debris dragon one for one, line, one for one combo. Yeah, like it, it's there, but it's so rare that you're actually going to be able to pull it off. That it's it's completely unreliable to do. Kind of like if you do if you can get that discard loop off with, uh, with X sabers, like more power to you. But more often than not, way more often than not, that's probably never going to happen. If two or, of your opponents in a YCS rescue cat double fault for you, it's just not your day. It, it it isn't, and you shouldn't. I well, I wouldn't expect that happening at all. To exactly. Yeah, I could see. Like, I wouldn't maybe, expect like, it really to happen once. Yeah, like maybe, like maybe I can see, like maybe two cards get stripped out of my hand, like a card or two. Like I can understand that, but not your entire hand off the bat. I don't think I've ever got full troll looped ever. But like I've I've seen it happen. I've done it like against the computer when I play like my video games. Like I've done it before. Oh yeah, for like, sure. Never, yeah, because that's because you know they're never going to complain. The computers don't complain if you ever cheese them up, but. You know, it's it's never happened to me like that before. And, but and that's kind of like the parallels I see from uh, from like past Yu-Gi-Oh to now. The only like the big skill I do see that we can at least like bring into current Yu-Gi-Oh is that you know how we mentioned that like you know if you get interrupted during like three or four turns in, you know, you kind of have to adjust your play accordingly. At least when at least like in current Yu-Gi-Oh, if you're like throwing everything all out, you can at least adjust on the fly if you get interrupted because it's it's immediate interruption. Uh, so you've got to do it like right off the hop and don't have as much time to be able to think about it. That's probably like the only positive I can say about current Yu-Gi-Oh! Because you've got to learn immediately on the fly 
like, uh, but again, like it, this goes back to like newer players getting into the game. It's like if they can memorize this one combo, they already have a fighting chance. And it's like it, I think they're just trying to lower like the like like the skill gap uh, of the game to kind of encourage newer players to kind of get more into it. Because you know, Konami is a business. They want the more players they oh, yeah. have, the, like, the better they do. At the end of the day, if you get resembled, but it looked like 15 years ago, that's the question. Would it be as popular as it was? Would you have 4,000 people show up to Long Beach? Would you have 2,000 people regularly show up to YCSs? Yeah. Maybe. I think the answer to that could be honestly yes. Mm-hmm. But clearly what the Konami has done has grown their game, grown <laughs> their business. Mm-hmm. And to what extent do old Yu-Gi-Oh players from 10 years ago's opinions really matter? Yep. You know what? We have our little niche old formats. We can play Go format. We can play online. We can build these decks and play against each other. Mm-hmm. And that can satisfy our itch for Yu-Gi-Oh. And they can continue to print pendulums and all of Link monsters and do all of these things. And mm-hmm. if it's growing their business, that's what their main objective is at the end of the day. That, that's ex- exactly what it is. So it's not like I can like really blame Konami for like the, the direction they're going because they want the more people, the better for them. That, that's what they want because uh, that's you know that's their business. That that they have to look in the business standpoint. I'd be curious to see what the popularity of the game would look like if they never released Pendulum Monsters and Link Monsters and all of those other things. Like, what if the game continued with releases from let's say seven, eight years ago? Yeah, I think they could have continued. Like, for example. Altergeist, that deck kind of resembles an older school deck. Mm -hmm. Sky Striker kind of resembles an older school deck. They do still do that. I think they could or could have, you can't go back in time, but they could have still printed new things. They could always tweak the mechanics. I think that's one part they do like to change the mechanics every so often, print a new type of card, exceed, synchro. Mm -hmm. Just from what I have seen, going back and watching, it does not seem like there was a universal love of pendulums, particularly at their peak. Yeah. I didn't play. I don't know if you played during those times. I did, or... definitely did, but I wasn't happy about it. Yeah, right? Like, yeah. was that necessary? Did that improve and increase the player base? I don't know the answer to that, but if you told me that it didn't, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, like who is I, deciding I'm going to play Yu-Gi-Oh because this mechanic has now been created? Have yeah. they just kept things the same and just printed new decks? Could they have maintained or still grown the same way mm-hmm. without having to radically change the game? Mm-hmm. I think the answer to that could be yes. Yeah, I, I feel like the ge- when Pendulums came out, I feel like that it, it set the game back really hard because um, because I thought like it would create some like really hard damage to the game that it would be really hard to kind of take back in a sense because like because you know you know pendulums are they're part of the game now it's not like you be it's not like Konami's going to go out there and just start banning the entire mechanic outright it, it's going to be kept in the game i mean they, there they was could. a rumor about that they, they, i mean back they in the day yeah. i never i will always remember i think it was jeff jones said oh no konami does not <laughs> they know they made a mistake yeah i like, swear they can do ban them all and he's like who knows i vividly remember that yeah and i mean they didn't quite do that but they created a whole new mechanic, a whole new master rule just to reduce their strength. Yeah, and, and it would completely change the face of the game. I mean, like I remember like when Synchros came in, like I, I didn't mind Synchros because uh, it, it was kind of a cool mechanic. It felt like a it felt like a toolbox in this, especially with Teladad. It was a toolbox. Yeah, like what it was what, sweet. What level eight synchro was the best best card for the situation at hand? That's and that's what I saw it as. And then I was a little bit negative with XIZs at first, but then I grew to to accept them and not have a problem with them. Yeah, because I like them. They, they had the same concept basically as uh, as synchros. It, it just became toolboxes. What's what's so, the best? And both of those, yeah, required that you made deck building concessions. You needed mm-hmm. monsters of the same level, or you needed to include tuners, and tuners were for, for the most part underpowered on their own. So you actually mm-hmm. needed to make deck building concessions. What mm-hmm. concessions do you need to make to play link monsters? You just need to play monsters. Yeah, you just play just, monsters. Just There's monsters, no concessions. Yeah. 
because there's a lot of like there because there's so many like generic link monsters there's not a lot of like link specific monsters or if there are it's already part of the deck so it's it's not like the biggest restriction that's kind of hindering there's no concession you just need monsters you can even use tokens you just need monsters everything yeah when i found out that tokens could be used as like monsters i'm like oh no that's that's not good that's going to speed up the game greatly i'm like i know exactly yeah yeah i think link monsters were basically obviously a a way of limiting the power of pendulums but Mm -hmm. you're telling me you couldn't have done that differently yep or found a way to I mean, just the idea of just any monster can be used as a link monster. It's like, how much further can we push the envelope? First, we made it so that you had to play tuners and that innately limited the power of your deck just by virtue of having a monster that was kind of an inferior monster. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, now you have to make the deck building concession of having two monsters of the same level. Mm -hmm. And obviously we'll release themes that promote that, but you do need two monsters of the same level. Mm -hmm. And now it's just play monsters, any monsters you want. Two two monsters, yeah. Just anyone you want. And then they try to put a restriction on it, but then it's then it's like, no, well, that's it didn't really help at all. It didn't help that much. And then of mm-hmm. course now with the latest master rule change, now it's like, okay, well, let's open up the game even more now by allowing the uh, you know exceeds and sicker monsters and fusions. They don't have to be to arrows where they point anymore, which they, the game open up like, oh, like even more again. Like, I, oh. I know you would you would think that that would have limited or slowed things down. It actually did the complete opposite. Yeah, and then they just made it faster and faster. I'm like, like, what, I mean, what direction do you want this game to go? Like, I, I don't know, but um, as much as I don't mind variety, I don't like it when the game becomes like way too dependent, too dependent on the first turn. That the thing yep. like, because we can't bad hands sometimes. And now deck building, I find is you've got to build your deck to have the most consistent first turn hand. You've got to have the first turn, like your first hand's got to be consistent. And if you don't get that, well then. Your 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 SOL, uh, uh, basically. Yeah, that wasn't an issue 15 years ago. 15 years ago, it's like, oh, I'll have 10 turns before it really matters. Hopefully, within yep. the first 15 cards, I can interact. Yeah, it's like I I never had a problem with OTKs, but it's so long as that like it's not an OTK being churned like every single turn. It's like there's the threat of an OTK I don't have a problem with, but so oh, like I don't... they could have call premature snatch cyber dragon. Like sure, yeah, sure. Congrats, fine. like it happens. Fine. I'll get over it. Fine. Yeah, they they have they have Cyberstein. Okay, that that's fine. And they have yeah, Troop Dupe Scoop. Okay, whatever. Like, but but it's not consistent every single turn. It's dependent on being able to have like a, a card trooper and a and a machine duplication being able to draw it. Fine, cool. But now it's like every single card has to work together in order to like create this end goal, which now is kind of which is actually very easy to do now. And like I'm seeing players that can play the game with like three months four months and all of a sudden now they can start winning because they can know how to get uh this like this one combo on board and just and maybe like a lesser player may not be able to ha- learn how to break it so it, it, it's just what it is and like we don't nobody likes die roll formats nobody likes them at least to my I mean, knowledge nobody does plenty of the formats that we played were die roll formats i mean if i won the die roll and open rabbit i was probably going to win so mm-hmm. There were issues with formats even 10 years ago. So I don't want to make it yeah. seem like even those 2011, 2012 formats were perfect. They weren't. If they opened up Shark Magician, you lost your own hand. So there were die roll formats back then too, for sure. There were. Uh, I would just make the argument that um, the, the probability of winning um, back then with winning the die roll is less compared to what it would be now. That's just the only, that's the only thing I would argue between them. I'm not the saying there was. For sure. Yeah, and if you go further back, two thousand four, five, six, seven, eight, mm-hmm. the die roll mattered because it was an extra card. But the game yeah. went on long enough that you could get out of it. It wasn't that big of a deal. Yep. So your opponent played dust shoot on you turn one. They were annoying parts of troop dupe were going first was really good, but generally speaking, the games went on long enough where it didn't matter who went first. It did a little bit. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but it may have mattered fifty five forty five, not anything more than that. Yeah, it, it, exactly that. I mean, like we always chose to go first anyway because we wanted we wanted that extra card, and we of course we wanted to, you know the trap cards to be like live immediately. Of course, like there there are plenty of benefits of going first, and but that doesn't mean like you're automatically handicapped like greatly going second, which is what we're seeing a little bit more nowadays. I mean, there's still like I, I mean, still the greats can still win off being turned two of course th- there is that but still like, you don't want like a format that's completely like that's mostly die roll dependent i think it's like zo i don't know if you're ever playing during like zodiac format at all i went to an event during the tail end of it 
after yeah. a lot of the limitations, but I know what you're about to talk about the fusion yeah. substitute variant. Yeah, because like those variants were like were you know for uh, first would win, and like I think the Nationals in Chicago that was also a big uh, that was also like a big die roll format as well. It's, it was go first and set up all your D bears and everything like that. So that was th- that's an example of like how Yu Gi Oh has become like a really die die roll dependent format. I, I don't think I've I don't I never lost uh, going first. But I, but and I barely won going second when I ever played Zodiac, and that just could be me just not being the greatest player and all. But that's how I had it majority of the time, and you know nobody wants that. I, no. I, at least I don't. At least I don't want that for sure. And I think I could speak for a lot of people who have that. But at least like way back then, not as not as prevalent. And again, this goes back to like the play style that you can have too. Way back when, it's like okay, play defensively, maybe set more bluffs. Like you know you can. There's a lot of psychology that's involved with it, and I think that's a big that's a big part of the game in my mind. But a little bit hard to utilize if you just all the cards are being thrown on the table and just kind of go from there, kind of thing. Not to say that doesn't have a role, but it's takes away from it a little bit in my mind. There is a good balance. You can have aggressive decks, like Marmills, for example, is a good example of a pretty aggressive deck from the 2012, 13, 14 era. Mm-hmm. It was pretty aggressive. Same thing with Sylvans, honestly, mm-hmm. and you didn't necessarily feel powerless if you didn't have a hand trap. Mm-hmm. Sylvans could definitely establish a pretty strong board, but the strongest they could do is summon Felgrand. Yeah. Felgrand, you can play around. Same thing with Dino Rabbit. Same thing with Rescue Rabbit and Zalagia. You felt like sometimes, maybe not 100% of the time, but sometimes you could play around that. If your opponent has no hand traps and you go four negations, three bounces, what are you going to do? Yeah, I feel like even those older formats, those die roll specific formats, <laughs> or formats that the die roll matter, but maybe not to the extent they do now, even the best thing your opponent could do, you could generally still get through. Now, there are exceptions, the wind up loop being probably the best case. But even if your opponent's summon Shockmaster, at least you can set some trap cards, maybe chain something. I felt like there was still play involved. <laughs> but that certainly varies by the format. Yeah, and, and even like I mean, in, in the back in the day, like you could still lose even before like the game began. Like if you get hit with like dust shoot and uh, like delinquent oh, for example, for sure. like, that happens. But those happen like those are few far in between when they occur. It, but as a, compared to like newer formats now, that it, it seems to happen more often than not that you know the game can be dictated on the first turn. And like I could be like exaggerating a little bit when I say all this, but it, but that's just how like how I feel the games evolved to like being a player who's played the game since like 2004 and seeing how this game has evolved up until now, I, I feel like it's your first two turns are critical. And if you can't, uh, if you can't play within the first two turns, you're, you're pretty much pooched out of the game as opposed to, I can have a bad hand for like three, four turns in old Yu-Gi-Oh and still fight out of it and come out with a win. Like I can be confident with like, okay, I, I had a bad hand, but like I can still play out of it. And I, a lot of players, I think now that when they lose, it's like, oh well, I didn't have a good hand, or it's like, or my opponent just had this and this and this, and that, that's why I didn't win. Like, I feel like that's a bit like a big like kind of excuse now that's being used a lot in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, back in the day, does shoot in isolation, confiscation and isolation, those type of cards mm-hmm. were obviously really annoying, particularly in the first turn, of course. But if they weren't backed up by something like Magician of Faith, recurring pot agreed, graceful confiscation, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You generally would see enough draw phases after a dust shoot mm-hmm. where it didn't feel like the game just ended. So even those annoying people typically used to call them pre-negators, mm-hmm. cards like forceful sentry, confiscation, and dust shoot. Mm-hmm. What's the worst thing your opponent can do? Well, there are bad things. They can set faith and maybe have used graceful charity. And if you can't interact with that, you're going to lose. Mm-hmm. But by and large, if they don't have that particular sequence of cards... What are they going to do? Like summon Mystic Tomato? Big deal. I'll set Sakuratsu Armor and we're going to sit here and play for the next 10 minutes. And maybe by the eighth or ninth turn, I'll forget you even opened Dashu. Yeah, exactly. That. At least like you have like ways to be able to fight out of it now. And uh, you know, that's that's just a big thing. Like time is time is definitely a factor. Like you'd had a little bit before, maybe not so much now. And that's just kind of like the parallels I always draw from like modern Yu-Gi-Oh compared to, to past Yu-Gi-Oh and like the way like the, the whole... F- philosophical standpoint of the game has shifted i mean that that's that's just how a game works like evolution is is part of the growing mm-hmm. process but of course there's like good ways and bad ways of how the game can mature and i think 
Come out, we said some good things, but there's also done some bad things. Like, I liked Synchros, I liked XYZs, I like it, but I didn't mm-hmm. like Pendulums, I wasn't a f- and I'm not a fan of Links either. So it's just those kinds of additions to the game where it can be healthy or unhealthy in that matter. I think a good way of looking at it is there are really two variables. <laughs> Decisions and quantity of turns. <laughs> Older Yu-Gi-Oh! typically was a lot of turns and a lot of decisions. Those two variables were high. Yeah. Now it's a lot of decisions and fewer turns. Mm-hmm. And to me, I like more turns because it generally speaking means more draw phases. You see more cards so that when you're making those decisions, there's a lot more possibilities of what your opponent could have. Mm-hmm. The way decks were built 10 or 15 years ago, there were half a dozen, if not more, different trap cards, a bunch of quick play spells your opponent could have, depending on the format, maybe hand traps. So while both players had a lot of cards at their disposal, they had to play around a lot of cards too. Mm-hmm. More modern Yu-Gi-Oh, generally speaking, assuming this deck that you're talking about didn't draw a bunch of cards, there are a lot of decisions within that first couple turns. Mm-hmm. But it's only those first couple turns where those decisions are made. Mm-hmm. And and I always say like the lesser players when it comes to those turns, it's not the first turn, but it's what you do the second turn and the third turn afterwards to win those kinds of games. Because everyone can do the first turn. That's not the big deal. But it's how you play like after you get punched. Like when you get mm-hmm. when you get yourself to a reduced game state, now how do you play the game? Because you're not used to this. You're always focused on getting that first turn off. But now what do you do afterwards? And I think that's like a big weakness of uh, where like the lesser players who are trying to get better, they don't know how to deal with those situations as opposed to the better players. They know how to deal with, okay, turn two, turn three, turn four. Let's Now we can think turns ahead at that point in time. Oh yeah, I mean, that's the biggest, one of the biggest developments that you'll make as you're improving as a player. Mm-hmm. The moment you start to think, how am I winning this game? Mm-hmm. As opposed to what can happen if everything goes perfect is a huge point in time. For a long time, I was always like, okay, I want to set Dekoichi and Sakuratsu Armor on the first turn. I want my opponent to summon a Mystic Tomato and attack my Dekoichi, and I'll flip Sakuratsu Armor. And then on my turn, I'll flip Dekoichi and summon the Stalos. Like, mm-hmm. I was just tunnel visioned into this everything goes perfect mindset. Mm-hmm. And I think for a lot of the teen years, 15, 16 year old, that type of mindset definitely limited my development. Yep. It's when you really start to think, my objective here is to win. How am I actually going to go about doing that? Mm-hmm. And how many turns ahead might one have to think in order to actually plan that out? That's a really big developmental milestone. Yeah, it it definitely is. That's that's where I think like a lot of the good players uh, like start to evolve into like the great players and just having that being able to think, have some foresight and think ahead uh, really separates yourself uh, from the top. And I I think that that's a skill that, you know, just can't be taught by uh, it can't be learned by everyone rather. And it's something you just got to be able to know or else uh, you're not you're going to be left behind. I think anybody can learn it if they put their mind to it. I think there's definitely a little bit of that. I mean, experience, I think, is a great great asset to learning. Yep. And if you have the commitment to and the desire to question, why did this work the way it did? Or why didn't I win this game? Or Mm -hmm. why is that person who is having success doing things that way? Mm -hmm. And once you start to answer those questions, then you can reflect on your own play. Mm Mm-hmm. So I do think just about anybody has the capacity. I don't think it's a an entirely innate skill. I think it is something that can be developed. It, it definitely can. It's just a matter of like, you know, it's the growing process. Mm-hmm. That's all. It's just how fast. Well, for sure. Yeah. Uh, some people definitely have the predisposition when it comes mm-hmm. to these strategic type games, whether it's Yu-Gi-Oh or anything else. Yeah. Where it just clicks a little bit faster. Totally yeah. concede that point. Yeah. Oh man! Well, Joe, I, I, it's been a f- fantastic time talking to you. I re- really appreciate you taking the time out. Uh, any shoutouts you have uh, before we go? Oh wow, shoutouts! I mean, there's um, honestly an endless list of people in my <laughs> life that have contributed to my Yu-Gi-Oh career. Anything from I don't even want to start to name the people in my local area, but certainly the people in my local area mm-hmm. deserve that shout out from the people that I play tested with, traveled with. My parents, when I was younger, being willing to drive me out to local tournaments mm-hmm. every weekend. I don't think I would have played if when I was 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, I wasn't being driven out to local tournaments every weekend. Yeah. When I got a little bit older and started having success, I started writing for ARG. I wouldn't have been able to travel, at least with, that, with the ease that I did to a lot of those events in 2011, 12, and 13, if it wasn't for ARG and the opportunity to write for ARG. 
whether it was from a flight or a hotel here or there to help go to virtually every single event for what seemed like a couple years straight. So yeah. definitely in a more modern context, there was a lot of people that helped me when I returned at the end of 2019. Again, mm -hmm. I'm not going to name names because there's honestly a lot of them. And then anybody who's supporting my channel today, mm -hmm. I certainly have to give a shout out to people who I've been playing with. There's a handful of people both remote dueling and then over dueling book that I've used to record matches. So anybody really throughout any period of my career from the early days going to the locals to when I was really competitive traveling just about every month to anybody that I've interacted with in a modern capacity. Mm -hmm. And then I'd be remiss to not mention my fiance who puts up with me recording these videos <laughs> a few times a week, every night yeah, and doing these interviews and whatnot. <laughs> sometimes she's she has to watch my cat who can get pretty loud at this time of the night <laughs> that's fair enough sometimes my cat will jump on me when i'm trying to do a podcast it's like oh yeah. surprise there you go it's like oh again I, i've had to kind of interrupt the podcast here too or like when i've done like interviews like with my with my daily career you know so it mm -hmm. it, it happens but you know that's it, it's it's kind of funny what happens you laugh it out when i look back at it but it's like oh why did you have to do that cat oh, oh yeah and again, if, you, if you're listening, uh, don't forget to subscribe to Joe's channel, YGO underscore history. It's on YouTube. Great set of videos if you want nostalgia and just kind of learn uh, some of the top decks that happened back in the day. And uh, Joe, thank you so much again for, uh, for joining me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. No, thank you. I really enjoyed this. Absolutely. And you have yourself a, a wonderful night. And uh, I'm going to have one of your friends on uh, in, a, in a couple weeks time so uh you ha have fun with that we'll get corn pops on there. i won't reveal who corn pops is yet but all i'm right. gonna have them on in a couple weeks time all right i won't spoil it either all right wonderful have yourself a wonderful night thank you so much you too